All right, hello everyone, and good morning. Welcome to my YouTube live for April 4th and 2024, and April 5th here in Australia. Thanks everyone for joining. And um, yeah, let me see, how many people do we have here now? Hmm. Sorry, I'm just gonna check this out. So we've got a, a couple questions that have already come in that I'll be answering. And then if people have more questions as they come in, you can just put them in the chat, put cues next to it so that um, you know, I can see it. And then um, I will try to answer all the questions that I can. Obviously, I can't always get to everybody, but I do the best I can and uh, always try to uh, at least get all the super chats anyway. And um, so we'll be able to go until probably about noon today. So we've got a good two and a half hours, maybe ish a bit more. And so, uh, yeah, we'll see how we go. Anyway, so there's a question from Brad. Um, do coffee and alcohol affect triglycerides? Uh, alcohol, definitely, yes. Coffee, potentially, it can screw around your blood sugar and give you a bit of a screwy time with that. But um, I, don't, I don't know that coffee itself affects triglycerides, not that I know of anyway, uh, but alcohol uh, will uh, raise those. Yeah, they, they generally do. And then it looks like it's an anniversary for PJ Equine Lady. So uh, happy anniversary to you. Thank you very much for joining on the call and um, thank, you for, thank you for your support. Hopefully it's helpful. I hope you have a really nice anniversary and like a really nice steak between the two of you. Sabine Yu, thank you for the super chat. Need ex external carbs on ADHD medications? Doctor says yes. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, in fact, if you don't if you don't take in carbs, generally you don't need ADHD meds. Um, so maybe in that sense, they're correct that yes, you know, you you need to eat carbs so that your brain doesn't work properly, so that you have ADHD, and then you need meds. So for uh, you to, to need the meds in the first place, yes, uh, eat carbs. But if you don't want the meds at all in the first place or much less of them potentially, then uh, no, you don't need to eat carbs. Um, I don't, and that's the thing. It's um, it's funny. It's funny that, that doctors will say that because, you know, there's like, there's no, there's, I mean, where, where, where are they getting that from? You know, like, is there some sort of study or experiment that's shown that uh, you do better if you eat carbohydrates when you take these medications? No, not that I've ever heard of anyway, but there are studies and experiments intervening with people with ADHD and taking them off carbohydrates, putting them on an animal-based diet with no carbs and, and having that help their ADHD and get them off medications. So it's very, it's very strange where people get these notions, but it's 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 something that I've seen a lot with doctors and other experts uh, in any any field. You know, Thomas Sowell writes a lot about this about the intellectuals and how you know they're very adept and an expert in a particular field, and then they think that this applies to every other field on earth, and that they're just you know God's gift, and they're just an expert in anything and everything that they they choose to talk about. And so their opinions then become facts. You know, there's things that they know very well, and they are, you know, ex very, very much experts in that field. And then there's something else that they aren't an expert in, but they believe it to be so because they're so used to being an expert. It's just like, yep, that's what it is. And they and they can speak so confidently because they are used to speaking confidently about things. I see it. I see it all the time. And, uh, and they fall into this trap where they just assume that they know things that are just their own opinion. And they forget that it's opinion, that it's not actually something that they've learned. Um, so that's, that's dangerous, obviously. Um, so no, you don't need carbs for ADHD medications. Um, and, um, and, but you do need carbs to have ADHD. <laughs> um, not always, but there are, there are, um, a lot of people that are coming off their meds for ADHD and other psychiatric issues um, by going zero carb and um, animal-based, meat-based, keto, carnivore. 
sort of thing. And that's actually been, you know, this has been done in experimental interventional trials and there are larger RCTs being done at the moment over at Harvard and elsewhere. So no, you don't need carbs. No, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate for anybody at any time, anywhere, except if someone accidentally overdoses on uh, insulin and they're going to die without it, right? That's the only case, but no physiological function requires exogenous ketones or, or exogenous uh, carbohydrates or ketones. You just need to eat real food. Your body will make carbohydrates. You don't, you don't, you absolutely don't need it to eat carbohydrates. Um, unless you've done something to yourself harmful, such as taking way too much insulin on accident. Another question from Sabine. Hey, Dr. Chafee, uh, my psychiatrist said that I need extra, oh, so this is part of that, extra carbs when I use stimulants for my ADHD. Won't my liver just take care of it? Uh, and gluconeogenesis, <laughs> gluconeogenesis size, more glucose, if I need them. Exactly. Yeah, you'll have plenty of carbs. Beth uh, Rademacher, thank you for the super chat. Is lamb just as good as beef for strict carnivore or is beef a little better? Is grass-fed meat critical? I have a hard time finding it. Thank you. It's not critical. It's objectively has more micronutrients and has a better omega-3 to omega-6 profile, but it's not critical. I mean, a, a, a lot of people are doing extremely well on, on grain-finished beef, grain-finished beef or lamb. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that if it's not accessible to you. It is, you know, really, really, I, that's the best is grass fed and finished regeneratively raised beef, right? Or wild mastodon would really be the, the top notch, but it's, um, it's not, it's not critical. It's not like, no, you have to do this. You can't do it any other way. No, just eat the meat that you enjoy, that makes you feel good, that you have access to and that you can afford. And so if that's grass-fed beef for some people, that's great. And if it's grain-fed beef, then fine. And if that's pork, chicken, fish, and eggs for other people, that's fine too. So just, it, but any meat is going to be better than every plant because all meat is good for you while every plant causes harm. So, but yes, there are, there are better or less good uh, types of meat. So lamb is, is pretty much just as good. Um, Salisbury back in the 1800s, when he was telling people to go on just a red meat and water diet, he thought that beef was definitely the best and lamb was a distant second. And I think that's probably due to age of the meat back then. Back then they weren't, they weren't, um, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't think they, they ate the steers, um, when they were, you know, like yearlings like they do now. And so they maybe didn't have enough time to, to, build up as much nutrients. And um, so that might be part of it, but he thought that beef was definitely better. Um, you know, the younger, the younger the animal, the less time it has to sort of build up nutrients in the body. So that could be, that could be part of it. So um, having, having um, younger animals may not be as nutrient dense. I certainly found that the 10 year old cow that I got was just delicious. It was just it had really sh very rich beefy flavor. It wasn't gamey or anything like that. It just had more beef flavor. So it was like overpowered other steaks that I had. I, just, I couldn't even taste the beef flavor in those other steaks. I think what that, it, what you're tasting there are the, all the nutrients that you get out of the meat. That's, that's what the taste is. You're saying, you know, that's good. Those are good nutrients. And that's what that strong flavor was. So in that sense, you know, an older animal I think would be better. And, um, you know, but that was you now grass fed and finished for 10 years and had only eaten grass its whole life. So, you know, that's probably why that was, that was as good as it was. But, you know, if you, if you like lamb, you enjoy lamb and you feel good on lamb, eat lamb. It's great. Uh, Primal Mike uh, says, how exactly does dietary fat absorption work? If the digestion is not disturbed by artificial sweeteners or other factors, is all that fat either converted um, to BHB or excreted or maybe stored? Well, your, your body's really only going to be able to absorb fat 
uh, from your diet with uh, if you have enough bile and if everything is digested properly and then bile emulsifies it, then it's absorbed into your lymphatic sy system as chylomicrons. It actually bypasses your liver because things go to your liver I, either, either to get detoxified uh, before it hits the rest of your body uh, and or converted into fat and uh, for, for storage and utilization. But if it's already fat, your body's like, yep, get it in. That's what we want. Um, that's the important stuff. And when you run out of bile, then you really can't do that. It's very difficult for your body to absorb fat. Um, after that, you can absorb a small amount, but it's a very small amount. It's mostly medium chain triglycerides, MCTs. So when they get into your body, your body utilizes them. You, I, I just don't think for a second that your body makes a random amount of bile. So you get a random amount of fat. And then, oh my God, you've eaten too much. And then your body just stores that as fat because you've eaten too much. Well, it wouldn't absorb it if it was too much and your body didn't want it. So if if your metabolism is low and your body's uh, you know, thinking that you've been in a famine, you need to rebuild up your stores, yeah, it might store a bit, you know, a bit of fat. This is what those yo-yo diets do. People are just chronically starving themselves and burning themselves out. Their metabolism just bottoms out. And then they start eating normally again, and their bodies, you know, so their body thinks that they're in a famine, and the metabolism goes down to survive through a famine. That's what all animals do. Um, plants do this when they're in a drought; they 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 slow down the different metabolic processes that require water uh, in order to survive. We do that. All animals do that as well. Our metabolism slows down, and we store our fat and and hang on to our fat stores very jealously. And then when we start eating food again, our body says, okay, that needs to go into fat. We need to, you know, it might be the next famine's right around the corner. Maybe we're still in a famine. You just got a chance to eat. So we need to store this, hang on to this. But we're going to keep that metabolism low. Um, and so you might put on fat. So, you know, your body's going to decide, you know, what it uses for energy, what it uses for fat, what it uses for, you know, building blocks of material. And um, so just, I just let it, you know, our bodies know a hell of a lot more about, you know, what it's doing than, than we do. Like we're, we're never going to understand things to the extent that our body can, you know, we're so making billions, trillions of calculations every second um, on exactly how to keep everything in balance. Like you think you're going to figure that out? I don't think so. It's never going to happen. And trying to figure, well, just this, this very simple equation, one gram of this to one gram, it's never going to be that easy. Your body knows um, your body knows what it's doing, though. So you don't you don't need to figure it out. What you need to figure out is that our bodies know what the hell is going on. And so if you're eating what you're supposed to eat, your body's going to do what it's supposed to do. And it's going to absorb the amount of fat that it wants to absorb. Almost all of the rest of it's going to go out. And then your body's going to use that, maybe store some of it for later use, because that's what it does. You put gas in the gas tank and then you run on that throughout the day and the week and the month. And so. Um, that's supposed to happen. That's normal. The only time you're going to absorb more fat than your body wants and store excess fat on top of what your body thinks it should is if you do something silly like take ox bile. And then you're forcing your body to absorb more fat than, than it actually is designed to. And then you can, then you'll, yeah, you'll store fat and that will, um, that will not be what you want necessarily. Kim Walters. Dr. Chafee, are you aware that synthetic vitamin B12 contains cyanide, hydrochloride, which is toxic to humans and used in chemical warfare? I am led to believe that the FDA has it listed on the website. Um, so yeah, so there's, a there's different kinds of B12. So um, there's like cyanocobalamin that has um, some cyanide in it. And then there's, um, was it hydroxy or hydrocobalamin, hydroxycobalamin? and uh, methylcobalamin. So um, I would only use the methylated forms, the methylcobalamin, that's one that's one that works best in your body anyway. Uh, so yeah, just don't don't take cyanocobalamin, <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're worried about that. Um, you know, some of these things, they have like a cyanide, you know, molecule in there, but they're bound up in such a way that it doesn't get like released as cyanide or, 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 or um, act in that way. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, um, and you know, if you're getting a, a bit of this stuff, you know, how much is it going to harm you? Can your body handle it? Probably. But on that same principle of why I don't eat lettuce, I don't want any toxins in my body. So yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, uh, give somebody cyanocobalamin. Uh, I certainly wouldn't take cyanocobalamin. 
And um, not that you need to really, you know, some people don't, don't methylate, um, you know, have like MTHFR and they need a bit more folate or, or, and, or B12. And so those people just need to, to add in a bit of liver uh, every now and then, and then your, your B12 will be fine. And so I've never seen anybody not be able to maintain optimal B12 levels, even if they have MTHFR, as long as they're adding in a bit of liver every now and then. And most people don't even need that. Most people do just fine, uh, just eating muscle meat. And, um, um, so, but if you're in that category where you're not, you're not quite there, you know, adding in a bit of liver and, and especially people early on, everyone's deficient in B12 because everyone's deficient in almost everything. And then you go to your doctor and you say, yeah, can I get a B12? And they're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's right in the middle of the range. You're perfectly fine. Well, the entire range, uh, I've never seen a range anywhere in any country that wasn't out of range, right? So their range of this is normal. The entire thing was way too low, in my opinion, and and most of that range was was critically low. So below four hundred in Australia um, and the UK is a basically you can get demyelination of your axons, so you should you get nerve damage, right? And most people are under that. So the range here in Australia, you know, is different for every lab, and that's the problem. It's just an average for the community. It's not an actual range of good health is um, you know 130 to 650 sometimes uh, 750 right that's the highest i've ever seen it um below 400 can get nerve damage brain damage brain shrinkage uh spinal cord thinning and we're calling that normal no of course not that's a that's a clear deficiency in the uk and in parts of europe that i've seen in in france and possibly switzerland B12 what was like 130 to 540. So it's even lower. And so they're saying, yeah, 600, that's a, that's too much. Like, no, um, everything in that range is way too, way too low. Right. Um, so what I would say is a, is a better range you know, for the UK um, and um, Europe. And because I think they use the same units and Australia, New Zealand is actually 800 to 1200 right so that, like they don't even get into that range so you know if you're if you're just coming to a carnivore diet you are likely extremely deficient and if you're under that 400 or in america under 540 you know you should think about taking you know getting a shot to bump you up you know because you, you have an actual an actual deficiency that that can harm you and so yes you know going on to meat only and adding in liver that will catch you up. It'll just take a bit longer. And so, you know, it's up to you really. But um, if you're really low, if you're like, you know, well under 400, then, you know, I would give somebody a shot of methylcobalamin just to, just to get them out of that, that danger range, you know, um, but methylcobalamin, not cyanocobalamin. Aaron Keeley says, um, since starting carnivore, I have peripheral edema. I barely have ankles. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm well hydrated. I'm taking Dr. Berg's electrolyte powder and two tablespoons of no salt, trying to get potassium uh, with no relief. Well, it may not be the potassium or the electrolytes. And, um, you know, it's, it's strange that people that, that you would get peripheral edema after going carnivore. That's, that's generally the other way around. If you're concerned about electrolytes, I would check your electrolytes. I don't think you necessarily need to take them, um, just, just for the fun of it. Um, also it depends on how long you've been carnivore. Most people only need, um, electrolytes early on. And so I wouldn't, um, I, you know, with, if you've been on it for a while, you, most people don't need it after that. Um, there can be other reasons for peripheral edema. You can certainly get, uh, shifts in, in, um, fluid shifts between tissues because your body's just trying to reimagine how the hell it works now. And so that, that can be a temporary thing that then resolves itself. You know, if you're having this sort of edema, you can also think about getting compression stockings and just sort of trying to keep those things together while your body's trying to figure itself out. And, Try and and getting um, its uh, fluid balance and fluid shifts a bit more under control. There can also be underlying issues um, that you know related to your heart or other sort of issues that that may just be 
presenting now and just sort of being uncovered. And so, you know, if this persists, you know, don't, um, you know, don't, don't forget to see your doctor and make sure that there isn't anything else that could be causing this. And um, hopefully that just goes away. Sometimes you do see that it sort of swells up for a bit and then it, and then it goes away on its own, but you can do the compression stockings and uh, don't forget to see your doctor if this persists or you have other sort of symptoms that you're concerned about. So um, Karami or Karame, thank you very much for the super chat. Feeling good with six hours of sleep on carnivore concerned regarding studies linking sleep deprivation in men to lower testosterone. Do carnivores require less sleep? Does eight hour recommendation only pertain to people who eat a, a standard diet? And how long do you sleep? People do tend to, to sleep or need less sleep and get more restful from less sleep and be able to handle less sleep. But um, typically people still need sort of seven to eight hour range. There are some people, there's a, there's a sleep scientist, a neurobiologist at, at Berkeley who um, you know, wrote the book on this. And um, I forget his name, but he's, a, he's an interesting guy. I've seen a few um, interviews he's been in. And he was saying it's like, it's very rare. I mean, there are people that, that actually don't need more than four or five hours of sleep, but it's like one in 6,500. The other ones are people that, oh, no, no, I'm fine. I only need that, whatever they think they do. But in fact, they're actually harming themselves and they increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's by like sixfold. And yes, you know, you need you need proper sleep to get proper hormonal function, growth hormone uh, being actually more important than uh, than testosterone. But if you're chronically under uh, sleeping, your cortisol is going to be elevated. And that's going to screw up your other hormones as well. You can give yourself prediabetes and it, yes, can lower your testosterone. So if you are doing everything you can to get light out in the, you know, get out in the morning, get light in your eyes. So your brain says, Oh, it's morning time. Start the clock on your day, get out. You know, when the sun's going down, so your brain says, yep. Yeah, okay. We need to make some melatonin and all these sort of things. You don't have bright lights everywhere as you're, as you're winding down for the night, you know, you're turning off the lights or using blue blocking glasses or just turning off the, the damn lights and getting off of TVs and screens and, and, uh, phones and things like that using a sleep mask blank out all light you know if there's any light in the room at all if you can see the silhouette of your hand in front of your face it's too bright it should be pitch black and so if you don't have it pitch black which no one does you know put a sleep mask on and then make it pitch black uh, you'll find that you'll sleep much better that way uh, what you really want is you want to be able to sleep until you wake up and so you wake up naturally doing all those things. And, um, and if that's six hours, then that's six hours. You know, I mean, you can't really force yourself to sleep longer than that. But uh, you want to get as much sleep as your body requires. So whatever that is, that's what you want. And if that's six hours, then, you know, lucky you. You're one of the lucky few that gets a couple more hours in their day. You know, everyone says, like, there needs to be more hours in the day. And like, well, you know, you got them. So you know, take advantage of that. Um, if that's really the case that, you know, you're doing everything right and you're just, that's just how much sleep your body wants. Great. Uh, get up, do things, you know, you've got two extra hours. You can write a book, do it, go to the gym and, uh, you get, you get a lot more done. You have two extra hours of the day. They can be very productive with those two hours. Uh, don't waste it on your phone. IT, thank you for the super chat. A popular health blogger recently stated that beef fat from grain-fed cows can lead to fatty liver. How important do you think 100% grass-fed is, and why would he say that? I don't know why he said that. Um, I don't agree with it. Um, you know, if you had you know grain finish, you know it might be a higher linoleic acid. You know, maybe you could you could argue uh, that 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 contributes. I don't know, you know, what sort of evidence they have. Um, one thing I have heard by from Dr. Lustig was that you know he's mentioned um, some studies that associated grain finished beef uh, having higher BCAAs, the branched chain amino acids, and that those had some sort of correlation with fatty liver. Um, but 
I didn't, he, he mentioned these, but it didn't have links to the studies he was talking about. So I don't know if, uh, which ones he was talking about directly, but the ones I found on, I tried to look that up. Um, they, they were just sort of just associative studies that weren't really, uh, very strong. And so at least those ones, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't all that convinced by them. And so, you know, you never know. I don't think that, um, uh, I'm not too worried anyway. And, you know, I've been eating, you know, grass, grass fed beef for years and years and years. I, I, I've, I've found a source of, um, grass finished beef. Now it's actually, um, be a new sponsor that, uh, that I'm bringing on now. It's uh, called Stockman steaks and they're just here in Australia. Unfortunately, they don't ship to the States or, or elsewhere at the moment, but they might later. And they, um, they do just grass fed, grass finished, pasture raised meat, beef and other meats. So, you know, that's great. You know, so I'm, I'm going to be getting that. And so I've started ordering from them more. And if you want to do that, they can actually check them out. It's just stockmansteaks.com.au. And you can use discount ch code Chafee. You get like a free bag of mints or something like that uh, or, or something. You know, there's like a free gift involved. It, right now it's it's mints and they have like fattier cuts and things like that for carnivore people. And you can just buy chunks of grass fed beef fat and uh, carnivore um, mints. That ground beef is going to be uh, has a bit of organs in it and a lot more fat. It's like 75, 35. So, you know. I've up until basically now, you know, I've been eating, you know, grain finished beef predominantly. I don't have fatty liver. All my liver function tests are perfect in my patient population. I don't tell them they have to do grass finish to tell them it's the best, but you know, most, most people can't afford it or, or don't have access to it. I don't have anybody with deranged liver function. I don't have anybody that has, has, um, gotten fatty liver as a result of going carnivore. I think it's all the other things that you eat along with it that's causing fatty liver. I don't think it's, I don't think it's the cow itself. And um, at least I haven't seen it. And um, the other things that you're doing are also going to mitigate any of these damages because you, you've gotten rid of all these things. You got rid of, I mean, fructose directly causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's been proven in uh, studies with biochemically, but also in studies with, um, uh, in humans in the pediatric population showing reversal of metabolic syndrome and fatty liver disease by just the removal of fructose and, in, and still keeping carbohydrates and not losing weight. Right. So, you know, that's, um, that, that satisfied the Bradford Hill criteria for causation and, um, and then alcohol obviously causes fatty liver disease. And that's why fructose causes fatty liver disease because fructose and alcohol are metabolized into the same uh, byproducts as, um, yeah, fructose as, as each other. Right. And so part of that metabolization is, is dropping out a fatty droplet and that gets stuck in the liver and that built up. So I don't know. I've heard that. I've heard that claim before. I don't really buy it. And I certainly haven't seen it in uh, my patient population. You know, if you're, if you're eating grain finished beef and, um, you know, most people's fatty liver disease goes away. You know, that's what happens. Um, if you start to develop this and, and you don't know why, fine. You know, switch to grass finished beef and see how you go. I mean, that's that's definitely the pinnacle. You know, if you're having any issues, that's where you go from there is you go to grass fed and finished. But um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, Tony, uh, Pemsel from Facebook says, hi, uh, I have atherosclerosis is carnivore safe for me. Type two diabetic CAC score of 10 and, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's not only safe for you. It is, uh, probably essential for you. It will reverse your type two diabetes and, uh, and your non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. As we just said, your CAC score that can go up or down for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it's only looking at the, the hard plaque, the calcified plaque, not the soft plaque. So we don't know how much soft plaque you have. And, um, and so, you know, it could be that you have a lot of soft plaque and if that starts receding, but it starts calcifying at the same time, your CAC score can go up, even though your soft plaque is going down or your CAC score can go down while your soft plaque is going up. There's really no way to tell. Um, uh, but it is, it is pretty good, um, 
useful information anyway. And a CSC score of 10 is very low. So uh, yes, um, carnivore diet is safe for you and it's going to be healthy for you. It's going to be he healthy and safe for everyone because this is really is our biological diet. This is just how we're, we're, we're built. And um, uh, so, you know, we're purpose built to eat meat and we get harmed from eating plants. It's pretty much that simple. RB, thank you very much for the very generous super chat. That's very kind of you. Uh, hello, Dr. Chafee. My wife who has Crohn's disease started carnivore about three weeks ago. She is gaining weight and very concerned. She only eats beef, eggs, fatty pork, and coffee, nothing else. What can be the reason for her weight going up? Well, it's, uh, it, you know, as I was talking about earlier uh, in this talk, you know, talking about the metabolism, you know, when you're starving yourself, starving yourself and chronically under eating, you actually slow your metabolism down. And then you, all of a sudden you get real food in your body. Oh, thank goodness. Like, okay, we're going to store on, hang on to this. Um, you can also put on uh, muscle, bone, things like that. Three weeks, you know, we will, you know, sort of tighten up the muscles. But, you know, it could be that she actually is putting on fat. There's There are metabolic reasons for this and hormonal reasons for this. There are some people that put on weight early on or, or even ongoing for about six months or more in some cases. Um, and this is largely hormonal. So, you know, you can check things out. You can sort of see how her thyroid is doing. Um, check her leptin and her fasting insulin. These sorts of things are good indicators of her metabolism. And it, is her metabolism in a, in a depressed state or in an active state? The higher the insulin is, the lower her metabolism is. The higher her leptin is, the lower her metabolism is. And the more difficult it is going to be to lose weight even on a carnivore diet. But the good news is, is that on a carnivore diet, a ketogenic carnivore diet, so no carbs, no sugar, nothing like that. Uh, no artificial sweeteners and no dairy that comes down fasting insulin comes down relatively quickly and fasting leptin comes down more slowly but it happens and it's when that comes down significantly and the metabolism improves then you start seeing more of the weight loss so it's very important to think about this as a as a medical intervention this is for her health first and foremost so for the Crohn's disease, I would really stick to just beef. I would cut out the eggs and the pork and definitely the coffee. All those things can be pro-inflammatory and can trigger her Crohn's disease. If she just goes red meat and water, so the ruminant meats like beef, lamb, goat, and venison, she will have a much better response to this. I mean, she'll improve dramatically just doing that, but she will have far better results if she cuts out everything except uh, ruminant meat, the beef and the lamb, things like that. And, and just water, no coffee. She will do best on that hands down. And so doing that, seeing how her Crohn's is doing, making sure she's doing well. Also, you know, if she's on medications for the Crohn's like prednisone, prednisolone, other corticosteroids, she's going to gain weight because that's the, those medications make you do that. But hopefully she'll be able to come off those medications by doing these dietary interventions and basically putting her Crohn's disease into remission, which it does. I mean, that's in, that's in the, that's in the clinical literature that people go on an elemental diet where you're just eating macros and micros you need, nothing else, that this is a better treatment for an acute flare up of Crohn's than prednisone, right? So it's just not eating certain things is a better treatment than steroids, right? So that's showing that cause and effect relationship as well. You know, if you remove something, the problem goes away, you bring it back, the problem comes back. That's a cause and effect relationship. So focus on her health, you know, focus on getting better, focus on the Crohn's going away. The weight will come, the weight will happen. If you're worried about it, you know, check the leptin, check the insulin, check the thyroid, check her, her vitamins, minerals, B12, D3, those sorts of things, or, or, or D25. Those things are uh, very uh, useful to the body, and most people are very deficient. And so you just optimize these things. You optimize her health. You get in a bit of liver every now and then and uh, make sure that her she's not in some critically low nutritional state. And then you just let her body get on with it, and she will lose weight. You know, she will. It just may take time. And if her leptin is elevated, it shouldn't really be above five. And, um, you know, then that's, you know, that's going to take time to come down. It's going to take more time for her to lose weight. It just is. Um, 
So I would just check those things out and just be a bit patient with it. Um, it's about healing. It's about health. First and foremost, this is not, you know, this isn't a crash diet to just try to lose weight. Um, it's, it's about optimizing your health. And when, you know, you get your health improved, your weight tends to improve as well. Um, and remember that muscle and bone also have weight. And so you can improve your lean body mass percentage and you can gain weight or not lose any weight. And you're losing fat at the same time. So you go by how you feel first and foremost. Very secondarily, you go by body composition, how your clothes are fitting, etc. Never do you worry about the scale, right? If you are putting on fat, okay, um, likely metabolic issue, hormonal issue, all the rest, just give it time. You know, you, the most important thing is is putting nutritious food in the body and allowing it to heal. It needs it needs to heal. We've been hurting our bodies for decades. We need we need to give it time to uh, to let that undo. The body fat percentage comes with that, but it comes with the healing. It's not necessarily the first thing that happens. For a lot of people, it goes along with it. And it happens really early. Not everybody. And those are some of the hormonal reasons why that can be. And, um, you know, women tend to do more of the starvation, yo-yo dieting sort of things. And then going back to carbs and sugar and things like that. And then starving themselves. And that, and they tend to be the ones that are that have a bit more difficult of a time uh, losing all the weight because they, they sort of, that, that sort of behavior can really trash your metabolism. So just give it time, focus on the health, focus on really healing the Crohn's disease, stick to beef, lamb, and water. And, um, you know, you can check, you can check those bloods if you want to. And, uh, and just to give you an idea, but eventually it'll happen. Make sure you're eating enough as well. Chronically under eating, even if you're eating the right thing, will again tell your body that you're in a famine. Your body say, "Oh no, we got to hang on to this." So eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Don't eat anything else. So try to stick to beef and lamb, and just give it time. It's a, this is the long game. It's not uh, you know it's slow and steady wins the race. Okay, and good luck to her. Milo phone bill. Thank you for the for the um, super chat. Your thoughts on polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega sixes, and inflammatory? Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of um, evidence to that, uh, to that, um, uh, to those being pro-inflammatory, and there's others going in the other direction. And you know, who do you trust? Well, you know, uh, I trust biology and physiology and um, evolutionary biology, and um, you know, or how much do we normally have in our body in our system? Not much, less than two percent, one to two percent, and the um, omega sixes that we we get from meat are things like arachidonic acid, which yeah we do need, but only in a small amount. Um, we don't need linoleic acid at all. We only need linoleic acid. That's the plant version of omega sixes. If we don't have uh, enough arachidonic acid, then we turn linoleic acid into arachidonic acid. But it's, um, you know, you sneeze and, you, and you, you mutate this stuff. It's very unstable. It can cause neuroinflammation and breakdown products and free radicals in the brain, causing distress to the brain. Um, uh, Dr. Georgia E talks about this. She's a psychiatrist from Harvard. And how omega 6s and linoleic acid specifically is quite toxic uh, to the brain, causes neuroinflammation. And, uh, and so for her field and uh, in psychiatry, um, she's, she's very much against it. And, um, you know, these polyunsaturated fats, you know, as we've increased these things and decreased animal fats and saturated fats, um, you know, heart disease rates have gone up. Alzheimer's has gone up. Cancers have gone up. All these other things have gone up. These are all associations, but it's not going the other way. Animal fats goes the other way. As we've reduced animal fat consumption over the 20th century and into the 21st century, heart disease rates and non-communicable chronic diseases, cancers, uh, strokes, Alzheimer's, autoimmunity, they've all gone up, right? So that's that's an inverse relationship. So we know it's not that. We know it has nothing to do with meat, fat, and, and uh, animal fat, I should say. Um, how much of, of a role does omega-6s play in the polyunsaturated fats play? I think probably a significant role. Uh, but it all comes down to the, the over overarching premise of we're eating things that don't belong in our body. We're eating things that don't belong to our species. And we're getting sick as a consequence. And omega-6s are part of that. You know, you're eating these things out of proportion of what we would in nature, what we've ever done in our biological past. And we're getting harm. That's all there is to it. 
Um, Dr. Chris Kenobi has written a whole book on this. He thinks that that's the main driver of disease nowadays is, is the omega-6s and the polyunsaturated fatty acids. You know, these seed oils that were industrial uh, lubricants, you know, like the Germans invented Crisco, I believe in 1911. They used it to like lubricate their uh, U-boats. The submarines were going around in World War One, And uh, then they ended up selling the, the recipe uh, to Procter and Gamble. And then Procter and Gamble paid the American Heart Association $20 million in today's valuation to uh, to lie and say that uh, it was better for your heart than than animal fats. So you know, it's just like, you know, the, this is the AHA. I mean, I literally just don't believe a word that they say. Everything they say is uh, you have to hold and with a lot of contempt and scrutiny because they've just been, there's so many examples of them being paid off by different industries like the sugar, like Procter and Gamble. And then the sugar companies, um, you know, paid them to say, uh, to lie about things like the Framingham study and say that, you know, it said that, um, that uh, uh, cholesterol, increased cholesterol caused uh, was associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease mortality. And it was like, no, it actually showed the opposite of that. You know, so that's, that's, um, uh, you know, just a completely corrupt organization from the get-go. And uh, you shouldn't believe a damn word they say. There are also studies, the only uh, randomized controlled trials, interventional trials, looking at LDL cholesterol, polyunsaturated fats, saturated fats, and cardiovascular disease and mortality rates. Um, there are three of them. And they were all buried because they didn't give the the outcome that the authors wanted, and uh, and they admitted to that decades later when these got uncovered, um, and they found that replacing um, saturated fat with polyunsaturated fats, in one case linoleic acid, which is omega six from plants, that this did indeed lower uh, LDL cholesterol, but ended up killing a lot more people of heart, from heart attacks and strokes from cardiovascular disease. So what do you want? Is LDL, just LDL, just no, nothing else. Just LDL causes heart disease, right? Higher LDL causes heart disease. Okay, well, we lowered LDL and it lowered heart disease. You know, or, or sorry, we, low, we lowered LDL and it increased heart disease, right? So that's not the case. We had higher LDL with less heart disease, with less heart attacks, with less strokes, right? And so you lower LDL and heart disease goes up. Strokes go up, heart attacks go up. Okay, I've seen some people say it's like, well, you know, all that shows is that linoleic acid is worse than LDL. I'm like, okay, well, what do you want? You know, it's like you're saying that LDL causes heart disease. Okay, so are you saying now that linoleic acid causes heart disease as well? Okay, well then, then what? You know, when you when you're getting these polyunsaturated fats, they come with a lot of linoleic acid. So what the hell are you supposed to do? Right. What are you supposed to eat that's natural? First of all, seed oils aren't natural. You can't get those things naturally. Um, and so, you know, what would we have been eating biologically that wouldn't kill us historically? You know, you got nothing, you know. And so, you know, this is um, it's a bit of a force. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just a bit of a mess around. You know, there's, no, there's nothing that, that we're eating now that even existed 50,000 years ago besides meat. It just isn't. Right. And so, you know, the idea that that um, we have to eat all these things that didn't exist, you know, 100 years ago, let alone 50,000 years ago um, is a bit is a bit ridiculous. You know, just we've just been unhealthy and miserable and dying of cancers and heart disease. You know, this whole no, you know, nature is, you know, the, the natural state of all life is is healthy. Because unhealthy species as a species, they don't last. And in fact, they don't exist in the first place because they come from species that were healthy and survived and adapted to some situation and changed a bit and changed a bit and changed a bit. So, you know, all life comes from those who survived all life. So we have to be descended from people who were healthy. And if we're eating a lot of meat and exclusively meat for a long time, we must have been healthy doing that. And so uh, now we are getting very sick as a population and we are hurting ourselves. And yes, we're surviving, 
but it's very clear that we're getting a lot worse and it's not going to go very well. And fertility rates are going down, um, diseases are going up. And so we're, you know, if we were doing that during an ice age, good luck making it through an ice age, uh, you know, fat, sick and miserable like that. It's not going to happen. Sally Yo, 1985. Thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. Became sterile from chemotherapy. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Two stem cell transplant and countless other chemotherapies. Can carnivore reverse my sterility? Um, unfortunately, I you know there is, is such a thing as damage done, and you may not be able to undo all the damage that you know that happens to your body, especially from you know really, really nasty, noxious things such as uh, as chemo. Uh, it's, it, it's very harsh stuff. And um, you know the idea is that you want it to be harsh so it kills these cancer cells, but it kills your cells too, unfortunately. And it, and it can sometimes kill, kill people. The hope is that it kills the cancer cells before it kills the, um, you know, the, the host, the patient, you. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's, um, you know, nothing else is going to do it anyway. And it can at least give your body a chance to heal from things and recover from things. You know, it's, there is such a thing as damage done though. And if it's, if it's completely destroyed your ovaries, it may not come back, but there are a lot of people that have improved their fertility and, and been able to come out of menopause and, you know, men in their seventies that I, patients of mine, uh, their testosterone goes from bottomed out to that of a healthy 25 year old um, is, uh, you know, that, that happens. But if, you know, if it's, if the ovaries are, have been compromised to the extent that they, they can't recover, even in optimal circumstances, you know, it may not come back. So I would still definitely try a carnivore diet just because it's going to make you so much more healthy in all other respects. It can hopefully help you keep uh, cancer into remission because of, you know, the, the principles of ketogenic metabolic therapy of starving out those cancer cells, uh, from, of glucose and other sorts of things and get, keeping your body healthy. So it can keep that suppressed, keep those cells suppressed. And, you know, if you get, uh, a re reversal of your condition and you, uh, reverse your sterility, then that's just a bonus, but I would consider it a bonus. I would do this for other reasons. I would do this for your other health reasons, optimizing your health. And then, you know, if you do, and so don't get your hopes up on these things because, you know, you, you can permanently damage yourself with something like chemo. And so, you know, you just have to look at this as like, okay, I'm doing this for my health and optimize my health. And I'm not expecting this to get better uh, from a sterility point of view, but if it happens, great. But if not, you know, then not. So don't, don't get your hopes up, but I would still try anyway, because it's going to help you in so many other ways as well. Terry, thank you very much for the very generous super chat. It's very kind of you. Uh, Terry says, no question, just supporting a cause. Well, thank you very much. That's very sweet of you. And it's nice to see you here. Thank you for joining. Terry Brown, thank you very much for the super chat. I'm getting ready for a kidney transplant in two weeks. Is carnivore still safe after a living donor transplant? Yes, absolutely. And it can absolutely help your kidney function. So it's, um, you know, it it's said in, in certain circles and just repeated that higher protein diets are actually harmful to your kidneys. That's completely untrue. The evidence in the medical literature shows the opposite, it shows that higher protein diets actually improve kidney function. It doesn't depress kidney function. And again, this is, this is what we're designed for. This is our optimal biological diet for all human beings. And so, you know, especially in, in times of extremity, like getting a kidney transplant or some other sort of major issue, uh, that's exactly what you need. You need to be eating your optimal diet. You need to be putting in perfect nutrition for your body and getting rid of everything else that can cause harm uh, as much as you can. Just in the world we live in, you're always going to be exposed to awful things. And um, but you know, all these plant toxins uh, can be very nephrotoxic. They may be very toxic to the kidneys. Things like oxalates they can directly harm the kidneys, and so they will they will shut your kidney. They'll slow your kidney down. And, and in fact, a lot of people 
with CKD4, CKD5, so chronic kidney disease four and five, have, have been reversing this by going on a carnivore diet. So yes, it's, it's, it's not only safe, but encouraged for people in any extreme medical condition to, to go on, uh, you know, to get optimal nutrition and feed their body exactly what it needs and get rid of everything else. And that, and that absolutely applies to uh, kidney function because it, it helps kidney function. So good luck with that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a shame that you weren't able to try this before the kidney transplant or, or if you're donating to someone, um, uh, that they weren't able to do try this before because, you know, if they're on full on dialysis, it's, you know, it's not, you know, that's pretty far gone. And again, there can be permanent damage done, but if they're sort of before that and their kidney still had some function, a lot of people have recovered a lot. I've seen a couple people, um, three, in fact, be able to come off dialysis, which is never supposed to happen. Um, but you know, there, there are, and a fourth now is, is making more urine. Maybe, maybe not, it, you know, maybe they will be able to come off, maybe not, hopefully, but if not, then, you know, and the transplants is, is certainly, uh, his best option. But at the same time, you know, if you're not at that point yet, a lot of healing can be done. And so, um, you know, just, just, uh, but either way, you know, once you get the surgery, you know, this being, you know, having optimal nutrition is, is definitely going to help recover from surgery and, and be as healthy as you can going on. Tulsi's next X. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Hi doc, six foot three, uh, 256 pounds, male 42. I ate about 270 grams of protein and maybe 200 grams of fat daily. Should I cut down the protein to lose weight? Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's one of those things like you need, you just need enough protein for your body's biological demands. You need enough fat for your body's biological demands. So you just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Generally a good ratio for people that aren't like, you know, competitive bodybuilders is about one to one grams of fat to protein or even more grams of fat to grams of protein. If you think about it that way, um, you're going to, if you're eating more grams of fat than protein, you're actually going to get a lot more calories. Oh my God, calories are so bad. Calories don't weigh anything, but if you're eating more grams of fat, you won't need as much grams of protein for energy. The majority of the protein that you take in is not being used as energy. So this whole calories in calories out model is, is ridiculous because you don't use most amino acids as energy. You use them as a physical structure and building components of your body. Every single molecule that your DNA codes for is a protein. It's strings of amino acids. And so that's what the protein amino acids that you bring in get used for is to make all the molecules and, and um, chemicals that your DNA codes for, right? Those are all amino acids. Those are all proteins, right? It's not just protein or muscle. Every molecule your DNA codes for is a protein and you need proteins for those building blocks. And so they don't get used as, as energy, right? So if you have a lot more protein in your body demands, then you're going to, you can turn, you can't really store protein very well. So you, you convert that into glucose and then into fat and you just store it, right? So if you're having a lot more, um, then yeah, you don't need it. It's an excess. And then you start using the protein as an energy source. Okay. Um, is that too much energy? Will that get stored or will it just get used? It depends. It depends on how much you're getting in. But if you're getting the same amount of calories a day and you're getting more of those calories from fat, you're actually bringing in less grams, right? Because protein when converted into energy, um, is about, you know, four, 3.4, um, calories per gram, whereas fat is nine calories per gram. Well, what there weighs anything, it's the gram, right? So you flip that around, it's one gram per nine calories for fat, three grams per nine calories of protein, right? So very different, right? So you have to take in more grams, more weight of protein to get the same amount of energy, right? So don't do that. Get your energy from fat, don't get it from protein, and you will lose weight. You will just physically bring in less volume of, um, you know, less matter less mass into your body and uh and you can weigh less as a result of that if you're you know if you want to check this you can check your your urine um uh, studies so your your kidney function studies sorry 
um, in your in your blood tests. And if your urea is going up independent of your creatinine, um, if your creatinine is going up, then you just need to drink more water. But if your urea is going up independent of your creatinine, then that can indicate that you're you're converting more amino acids into energy because you don't you're not getting as, enough fat to meet your energy demands. So don't do that. So you can raise your your grams of fat that way. But just listen to your body. You want to get enough fat. You want to get enough protein. So you want to keep eating fat, nothing else, or, or meat and fat, nothing else but water. Um, and then you tell by your stools. If you're getting hard, dry, constipated stools, you need more fat. Your body's absorbing it all, and there's not spillover. Your body can only absorb a certain amount of fat, then there's a spillover, right? And so um, that spillover keeps your stool soft. And uh, that's how you tell. And so you want to keep your stool soft. And uh, as long as you're doing that, you're not taking things that can that can make you have loose stools, such as coffee, tea, uh, artificial sweeteners, um, magnesium supplements, things like metformin and other medications. Those can all uh, make your stools more loose. Uh, but if you're not doing that, you only need meeting water, you go by your stools. And so if it's nice and soft, you're eating enough fat. That's all there is to it. If it's dry and hard, you need more fat. That's all there is to it. So I just go by that. You can you can tinker with things if you want to, but just make sure you're eating enough fatty meat um, that it, it satisfies your hunger and it stops tasting good, and uh, you should be fine. And you can check your urea too if you want. Uh, Dr. Good, thank you very much for the super chat. Any tips for someone with frequent urination due to head injury uh, being on the carnivore diet? Been on it for three weeks and am having a hard time losing weight. Well, it's early days. So just, you know, just keep that in mind. Make sure you're eating enough. Make sure you're eating enough fat um, and just give it time. You've had a head injury that can affect your urination. It may not get better even on a carnivore diet because not everything is, is a product of a, of a bad diet. Other things can be from a direct injury. Sometimes your body can heal from these things and you're in a better position to heal from them when you're on a, on a proper biologically appropriate diet, like a carnivore diet. For us, it's a carnivore diet. Um, and, uh, but it's not, it's not guaranteed. You know, neurological structures are very difficult to heal. A lot of them can though. I mean, some of these neurological issues that people have had long standing for years, uh, heal and it's crazy, you know, uh, maybe they don't get perfect, but they get a hell of a lot better than they were before. And then some don't at all. You know, it just depends on if your body has any capacity to heal that anymore. Or if it's just permanent scarred down, it's not going to get better. Uh, so hopefully it does get better in your case. As far as losing weight is concerned, you know, like I was saying before, there can be hormonal reasons, metabolic reasons, and all these other sorts of things. Just give it time. Give your body what it needs. And also gaining weight, losing weight is um, yes, hormonal, but also muscle weighs things, bones weigh things. And so if you're working out, you're going to put on muscle. You're going to not see the same amount of weight loss as you would if you weren't putting on muscle. Uh, but at the same time, doing things to put on muscle will actually help you help you use more fat as well. So go by how you feel, go by how your clothes fit, and also give it more time than three weeks. That's still very early days. And uh, good luck with it. I'm sure you'll do great. Peter Brown uh, is his birthday tomorrow. He's going to be turning 75 years old. Well, happy birthday, Peter. That's awesome. And uh, I hope you have a great day and a big old steak for your birthday. Put a you know, couple candles in it and call it a day. Uh, great stuff. Uh, good to see you here. Thank you for joining. Justine uh, Ratnice. Ratnice. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, last year, I developed uh, reticular slash varicose veins on my right leg and a few more visible veins on my body. I was eating a high carb diet, now carnivore. Is it, is it possible to improve vein health on carnivore? Uh, it is, but you know, once you've already sort of put down these physical structures, you know, they may not actually go away, but uh, some people have found they've improved their varicose veins, but you know, again, you know, we can, we can do things to our body that, that make permanent changes, but there are some things that you know, like skin tags. A lot of these things go away. Those sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of darkening in our axilla or around the neck and things like that, that can go away as well. That has to do with high insulin and, uh, rectal polyps, you know, or colon having these little polyps and growths, 
those can go away. So a lot of these things can go away, potentially those, but you know, you just have to see. And you know, if they're not, there are treatments to get rid of those things. You can get um, you know, sclerotherapy where sort of inject this sort of stuff and it and just sort of shuts them down. Um and uh, you know, a good friend of mine from from medical school, he does that now too. He's a he's an interventional radiologist and he just sort of fell into that and he, he sort of enjoys it. So it's uh it's very possible to sort of get that done just with a percutaneous procedure as well. And um uh, you know, and so see how it goes with the carnivore, give it, you know, six months, a year or something like that. And if it's, if it hasn't really improved in that time, you know, you can always look at alternative methods, but you know, your body will get a lot better and, um, you'll feel a lot better and could very well help that as well. Uh, but let us know, see what happens and then let us know how you go. Um, bachelor junior has a, thank you for the super chat. I'm not seeing a question. Uh, here we go. Uh, question is, I'm just having a tough time getting off cannabis, dropping my sugar, drinking too much, heavy whipping cream. You know, it's difficult to come off these substances. Uh, we, we become very used to them, we become addicted to them. And so, um, you know, it's, um, it's just one of those things that, that we just have to sort of have a good reason for coming off of them, you know, feeling better, wanting to improve our health in, in whatever ways, having more mental clarity, all these sorts of things. Um, whatever whatever reason you have, just you know, focus on that. Remember that these things you know do get better over time. If you if you go to these things as a crutch or whatever, you know, find a different hobby, find a different crutch, find a different something that 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 fills that same gap, and uh, and go to that instead of um, instead of the cannabis and the sugar and the heavy whipping cream. Eat a lot of fatty meat. If you're ever having a craving or whatever, eat fatty meat. Eat it until it stops tasting good. And then that often will suppress a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, urges and cravings. So hopefully that can help as well. Um, good luck with it. You know it's difficult coming off of any any substance. Um, I mean, I mean, not even cannabis, just sugar and uh, all these other sorts of um, nicotine and 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 caffeine and all these other sorts of things. It can be very very addictive and harmful to us and. You know, but good for you for for trying to come off this stuff. You'll get there. It'll be fine. And, um, you know, you can do this. Usually after about two weeks, these things go away. So it's a light at the end of the tunnel. If you can get to two weeks, the chemical addiction is going to be gone. And it's just about the mental addiction and, and going to this in certain circumstances when you, when you feel, uh, you know, like, you know, depressed or sad or whatever, you know, and you go to that as a crutch go to something else, go to the gym, go to the beach, go do sprints, something like that. Go see friends, uh, replace it with more healthy, uh, habits. And, uh, and then you'll just make yourself better and better and better. And you'll get away from that sort of unhealthy past. Good luck with that. There's another one down here from, from him as well, from a bachelor, bachelor or, or Junior, I don't know how to pronounce that. Does Dr. JB have any plate screws or implants from Rugby Lab? I do, uh, or I did. I had a plate and six screws in my right fibula because I, I broke my leg and ankle. Actually, I had it broken for me. Some bastard in Canada, um, I, I ran the ball. I sort of shoestring tackled me. And then when I was sort of being pinned down, he just took my leg and just like alligator rolled and just snapped my leg. Um, really pissed me off. It's one of those things that that when you get like a serious injury like that, you don't feel it. It's just all of a sudden you just go, you just get this charge of adrenaline and you just, you can't feel anything in your body. Your height is super heightened awareness and you just go, something's wrong. Okay. And, uh, and I was thinking, I was like, I think it's something to do with my ankle, um, but I can't feel it. It doesn't hurt. There's nothing there. And that's what the, the, these natural uh, opiate receptors are for. That's what opiates work on these receptors and that's what they're for you have some crazy injury your body goes oh no you don't want to feel that and it just shuts it down and um and i tried to, to to walk on it and i put my foot down and i put some weight on it and i could feel my foot slipping away from my leg and i was like oh that's not good and i was like thinking i was like okay uh you know i was thinking i was like oh sh shoot can i keep finish, keep playing because this was in the finals this was in the finals um up in up in canada we're the only american team in this league and they hated us for it. They did not want us there. There was a lot of, um, uh, hard feelings that, that, um, 
uh, that we were there. Now we're in the finals, and they were really pissed about that. Um, refs hated us too. We, we had very, very one-sided games. Uh, that's why I got into as many fights as I did um, in in these games because I just I would not accept people being cheap and dirty and throwing punches or stomping on heads and doing all those sorts of things. So I was just like, yeah, you're going to do that. I'm going to knock you out. It's like that's all there is to it. And um, I, I would not accept people hitting me illegally. And um, uh, so, yeah, I had a couple like, bench clearing fights and things like that, too. Um, but uh, but this time they yeah they're very dirty, very, very dirty um, uh, at that time anyway. And uh, obviously a very dirty move to intentionally break someone's leg like that. And so I was sort of just going like, oh, can I still play? And I felt my foot sort of slipping away. And I was like, oh, can't really do that. And um, uh, and um, so, you know, I was, um, so I was sort of thinking, I'm like, oh, probably can't play on this. And there was like, you know, only a few minutes left in the game. And, and we were down by one point and, uh, my fullback Ryan Bishop, just, I just hear him scream. was like, Chafee, get in there. And I'm like, right. Guess I'm playing, staying on. And, uh, and I just sort of hobbled over to the side of the ruck and like they, they had the ball. So I was, I just got down on my hands and then on my left leg. And I just like sort of curled my right leg up because I was the broken one up behind me because I knew if that, if that hit the ground, it would just, my foot would just rip off. And so I just, did that and then someone's running up and I just threw myself into their legs and um and just kept my foot up and sort of like three post bear crawled over to the side again did it again did it again did it again and um hey no and um and um so um uh then you know we got the ball and my buddy's just like hey you know run this move with me and I'm like I I can't run I do not give me that ball like my leg is is done he's like all right well just just be a dummy for me and so he like got the ball and I'm screaming for the ball and everyone just like shifted down onto me and uh passed it out we made a break started going up and then um trying to complete a pass to beat the fullback and uh, and win the game and the fullback intercepted it and then scored a try against us and that was it and it was like damn it so ended up losing and getting a broken leg which really sucked and uh, i was i went into the um i really couldn't walk after that and um i went into the actually went out of it. the trader put like a, a air cast on it and so i was just i was really really bummed by that and so um i ended up going out that night and um you know i didn't drink during the rugby season i'm like well you know my season's over my leg's broken so you know i'm not gonna be playing so i might as well drink and um and so like yeah i went out and um was like walking on this thing really shouldn't have and uh went into the er the next day and um and uh, they took the air cast off and it was just black you know <laughs> and uh but uh, like the uh, the resident was just like ooh, that is b-r-o-k-e and um and the attending was like well no you know think of your, your toronto ankle rules you know he came in he walked in here he's didn't come in he came in the day after on the day of and um, all these different sorts of things and and um so you know realistically he doesn't even qualify for an x-ray is probably not broken and uh, but we'll do an x-ray just in case and yeah just gone and um you know spiral fracture all the way up you know an unstable spiral fracture um and my you know you have your tib fib and your foot sort of sitting there and my foot was out here you know, so it was completely out of joint. And I was in to see an orthopedic surgeon the next day. And he just said, look, you know, if the, the broken bone is one thing, but, you know, this is out of joint. And if it if it doesn't get put back into place and repair the ligaments that are supposed to hold it there, uh, you'll never move that ankle again uh, without, you know, so you need surgery you'll never move that ankle again. And I was like, right, when do we do surgery? And he's like, well, do it, uh, yeah, two hours. I'm like, Sounds good. Let's do it. So I was like, it was in surgery that day and I got a plate and six screws and I did not walk for five months after that. I couldn't walk and my, my leg became skinnier than my arm. It was really freaky uh, because it was, um, it's, uh, that's not normal. And um, uh, yeah, and that was a lot of pain. That was hard to, how, that was hard to get over. Um, I've since got that, those, that plate and screws taken out and um uh, and then I detached my bicep tendon from the bone. Um, just arm got sort of tangled around, pulled around in a in a tackle, 
And um, and so I got that. So I finished the game. It was already. I was not going to get. It's not going to get more torn off the bone. It's already off the bone. So I finished finished the game, and um, you know, talked to the trainer. I was just like, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I've, I've torn my bicep off off uh, off the bone. They're like, ah, no, no, you wouldn't have, no, you know. And I was just like, well, I can't feel the bicep tendon, and and I'm flexing, and my biceps muscles rolling up my arm, so kind of feels like that's what it is and they're like oh god all right yeah okay and um again i was in surgery a couple of days after that so i have like a post in there so they drill a screw in there that has like really strong uh suture material back there and you cut off a bit of the frayed tendon and then you suture that down to the bone and you just have to leave it there for like six weeks you can't have more than a pound of pressure on the arm that was very difficult because i was supposed to go to thailand the next week so i sort of put it off another week and I actually went to thailand with this little weird arm brace on so sometimes people see them on my um instagram way down at the bottom is with that is with that that arm brace on and that's what that's from but um yeah it's not fun but um it's uh uh you know it's possible it is possible to get to get over these sorts of things um yeah did i frame my x-rays uh, no i didn't i didn't frame my x-rays i don't even know if i still have them um but uh, yeah yeah i don't think i still have that well maybe it's on my record somewhere back in seattle but <clears throat> but um uh no i didn't keep it anyway i think i still have the plate and screws though so i sort of i, I sort of kept those um when i got them taken out um so michelle peterson says thank you dr c for all you do i've lost 60 pounds off my thyroid and asthma meds feeling amazing that's great that's really great to hear i'm so glad to hear that and um you know really you know congratulations on on losing that weight and 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 reversing your oh, jesus come on buddy oh stop whiner and um, you know, congratulations on that. That's really uh, that's that's really a great accomplishment. Keep it going. Oh, so Terry Brown, this was about um, uh, the transplant. So thank you, Terry Brown, again for the the super chat, saying asking uh, because carnivore is not the renal transplant diet protocol. Yeah, it makes sense, uh, but it should be. It damn well should be the renal diet protocol and, and every diet protocol because that's what's going to be best for your body and for your kidneys as well um and uh, or or you know whoever else is involved as well um so that i i would personally well i i personally do do that and uh but if i was in that situation that's exactly what i would do um and i would uh yeah i, I would recommend it to anyone and everyone yeah so it was a question over from facebook um yan yan eblakas tamar Tamaras. I'm sure I butchered that name. I'm sorry about that. Um, hi, Dr. Chafee. I have healed a lot of health issues in carnivore, but this thing, uh, uh, one of my concerns, my magnesium doesn't absorb well enough because my gut issues still healing. Is it okay to supplement some probiotic called Synergy? Well, I don't, I don't know what Synergy is. Most probiotics aren't, aren't, aren't that great. You know, if you want to get more healthy bacteria down there, just use uh, live culture, plain Greek yogurt that has as little carbohydrates or no carbohydrates if you can. And put that on meat, chew up the meat with the yogurt together, swallow it in the same bite to try to hide some of those bacteria to get it past your stomach acid and get down to the lower intestine. And uh, and that can help with that. But just long-term carnivore is going to improve your, your gut health and bacteria. Um, other things can can strip out magnesium. Caffeine will strip out magnesium, but also coffee and tea, decaf versions of coffee and tea can strip out magnesium as well. Um, different sorts of plant toxins, all that sort of stuff, they, they strip out magnesium and other nutrients and vitamins and minerals and things like that or stop them from being able to be absorbed in the first place. Um, there was an interesting study with uh, zinc where they had people that ate, um, ate a bunch of oysters and they saw their zinc go up because oysters have a lot of zinc. And then they uh, gave that zinc with like you know, black beans or something like that. And it only came up like one quarter of the amount. And this, they were checking their serum zinc in real time. And it only came up like one quarter of the of the peak that um, 
that the you know uh, oysters on their own did, and then give them with like you know, like corn tortillas or something like that or something similar to that. Uh, didn't come up at all. It was just flat line, so they didn't absorb any zinc at all. So it matters. It matters what you eat this stuff with and what you eat later because the coffee can just strip this stuff out. So, you know, if you're having coffee, tea, caffeine, anything like that, just get rid of it. Anything else except meat, just get rid of it. If you need to supplement some magnesium, just try, try to get that up. You know, sure. Um, animal organs have more nutrients and are much more nutrient dense as well. So you can just sort of add those things as well. And generally you, you can get, get up to normal levels. And, um, it's also, it's also the case that, um, uh, that it takes, it can take months and months and months, even doing everything optimally to get your magnesium levels up again. So just be, be patient with that. Um, Okay. So Wired Fox from X says, is the reason for cutting out veggies due to the quality of the soil and growth? No, unfortunately, it's just due to the plant itself. Most plants will kill most animals. Almost every plant on earth is inedible, meaning that it's so toxic that even a small amount will kill you. Um, but the ones that are so-called edible are just less toxic. It's not that they're not toxic. It's just we have more ability to detoxify them. In fact, they will still kill other animals. So the plants that we eat will kill herb other herbivores like a koala, right? Um, you know, grapes will kill a cat. Avocado will kill a cat. I think they'll both kill dogs too. And so, you know, there are toxins in these things that, that the plant naturally makes themselves. Yes, we make that worse with soil quality, with lack of uh, biodiversity of the, micro, of the microbiome in the soil, of uh, pesticides, insecticides, and fertilizer, and all this garbage, you know, these uh, herbicides and glyphosates that we pour on these things. We're just, I mean, we're just, you know, adding, um, you know, uh, bad to work, make going from bad to worse. So, but the plants themselves are toxic. Most plants will kill you. Um, so the plants themselves are toxic. So go to my YouTube channel. Oh, well, you can go to my um, YouTube playlist called uh, Getting Started on a Carnivore Diet. I have a link to uh, a lecture I gave at um, a medical conference called Plants Are Trying to Kill You. And I have one on my channel too called Plants Are Trying to Kill You. But I like the lecture form better. It's just tighter. Um, um, it's less of a discussion. It's more of a tight sort of uh, presentation. And so uh, go to that. It's on the low carb down under a YouTube channel. That's the medical conference. And they uh, they have great videos on there. Also, by the way, everyone should should watch those thoroughly. And um, and uh, yeah, you check that out and look at the 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 video I did on called plants are trying to kill you. And that'll, that'll sort of tell you uh, probably more than you want to know about, about the subject. Dark sky. Thank you for the super chat. Is it possible for inflammation to affect the heart without having myopericarditis or endocarditis? I have arrhythmia without any findings except a high ESR. Well, it can certainly, it can certainly affect you and not have florid, um, you know, cardio uh, inflammation, cardiomyopathy or inf inflammation. Endocarditis is, you know, a, a very serious infection. Myocarditis and pericarditis, more inflammation of the heart muscle or the pericardium that surround the heart muscle. And that can cause a lot of problems as well. And uh, it can be very, very serious. Um, it depends on what your arrhythmia is. It depends on what's causing that. It may be due to inflammation. It may be from something else. Um, you know, either way, if you're just eating, you know, proper human diet, a biologically appropriate diet, you know, you're going to reduce a lot of inflammation. Your ESR is going to get better. Interestingly enough, um, I, I had a patient that came in who did uh, blood smears. Um, and uh, there were some, some doctors in Perth down in uh, Fremantle um, markets. They have sort of a little stand there and they'll do just a blood panel smear and they'll look at it under a microscope and take a picture and they'll show it all clumped up and weird. And so it can tell you sort of different things about your body and hers were all clumped up and stacked up really bad, which actually would give you a high ESR, which is the sedimentation rate of, uh, of your red blood cell, of your, of your blood, of your blood panel. Right. Um, so it's called ESR is erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So it's red blood cell sedimentation rate, how, how long they turn into sediment and just sink down on their own as opposed to being centrifuged. 
Um, the quicker that is, the more inflammation you have and, and the red blood cells just get sticky and stick together. You can see this on the blood panel and hairs were all stacked up and sticky and stuck to each other as well. You know, increase your risk of clots and heart attacks and strokes and things like that because they're all sticky and clumped. And then you have a bit of a reaction and it clots and it goes and all this sticky blood just doesn't go anywhere. Right. Um, that's a problem. And then she went uh, carnivore for like six months or a year or something like that. And it's just perfect. And like to the point that, that, um, you know, they saw her before and after and they're like, how'd you do this? What'd you do? We've never seen a recovery like this in this fast. We've never seen that. What did you do? She's like, well, I just went on a carnivore diet and they brought some of the other doctors around. Like, look at this, check out her blood panel. You know, we've never seen this before. So there can be a lot of things that can benefit from just lowering that ESR and lowering your in, in, um, inflammation levels. Will it help your arrhythmia? I, I don't know because I don't know what your arrhythmia is and I don't know what's uh, what's causing it. So it's always worth a try. Um, and, um, you know, but you can have an underlying arrhythmia that's, that's separate from, from, uh, uh, you know, nutritional abnormalities. Um, you know, always remember there are, there are real things, there are real medical issues that, that aren't a consequence of our diet, but 90, 90 plus percent of the issues that we our treating nowadays are absolutely caused by our diet. We get rid of those and we deal with the, the, the 10% that can't be addressed by diet. That's, you know, that's where we want to get to. Hey, little boy, what are you doing? Shock industry. Thank you for the super chat. 14 days in. I uh, love how I feel. However, I'm taking CBD oil at night to help with insomnia. Any opinions on this? Uh, thanks. Eat meat. Um, well, you know, I, I tend to, you know, like to go away from those sorts of things, you know, using something like else like melatonin, which would be a bit more natural, can help you sort of sleep, you know, optimizing your sleep routine, turning off lights, using blue blocking glasses, getting away from screens, getting away from phones and TVs and things like that, keeping the lights down very low, using yellow light, not white light, um, getting outside in the day, getting sunshine in your eyes, letting your brain know what time it is. Our brains tell the time by the frequency of light that's coming into it. And so we get on these screens with all this blue light and we get on, on uh, just most of our um, most of our, our lights. Lighting now is all, all blue lights and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it actually makes more of a, of a difference to our, our sleep and our health than we realize. So doing that, getting away from all those lights, getting to bed at a certain time, using a sleep mask, all those things can really help. And you may not need the CBD oil. CBD oil, again, going back to that guy from uh, professor of neurobiology from Berkeley that I was talking about, he's a sleep expert. He was saying that, you know, people use CBD oil to help them sleep and it can help them get to sleep, but they actually get lower quality sleep and they don't get into the lower um, levels of, of sleep that they need to, that are the really important restful parts of sleep that, that are very important for your brain and your brain recovery. So I would, I would avoid that if, uh, if you can, because I don't think that it is, uh, it's optimal. Okay. Um, let me just check one thing here. Hold on. Sorry. One second. Okay. Sorry. I was just, just the thought of that. I was going to change my, um, my settings on my, my computer to take off the stupid blue light as well. Um, great. So, uh, question from Kara May. Thank you for the super chat. Will a little whiskey every week ruin my results? Well, it's it's not going to help. Uh, it's not going to be as bad as a lot of whiskey more than once a week. Um, but, you know, alcohol takes like three weeks to get out of your system. So, you know, having a bit of that is it's just going to slow you down. Um, if you're having a bit of whiskey on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, that's obviously going to be better than drinking more whiskey more often and or the same amount of whiskey and eating all the other crap. So, you know, you're, you're getting rid of more and more things. And so if you're only eating meat and you're having a, some whiskey on the weekends, that's definitely thousands of times better 
than just eating a whole bunch of normal garbage um, because you're not going to be getting the proper nutrition and you're going to be bringing in a lot of other things that are harmful to you. So it's, it's not good. Uh, and it can also lower your inhibitions for eating garbage and uh, eating junk food and sugar and all that sort of crap. It will re-addict you to sugar and carbs again, and you'll start having cravings again. And so you'll just sort of have to constantly be dealing with cravings and not really feeling great. So it's, you know, it is shooting yourself in the foot. If you're able to maintain that and you don't break off, alcohol is one of the, one of the most common ways that people go off plan and they, they start drinking alcohol and then they just, they go back to just eating and go, ah, well, whatever. I tried it. It didn't work, you know, and um, so it's a major reason why people go off. So, um, you know, cutting out the whiskey is probably a good idea. I really don't drink at all anymore. Um, it's very rare, very, very rare. And if I do, it's something, you know, like just, just straight spirits like whiskey or generally like the clear liquid, clear spirits like uh, vodka, something like that. You know, just have a few of those once every few years and, and that's it. And, but it's been a long time. I don't even remember the last time I had a drink. It's like, it's at least two years now, I'd say. So, um, you feel a lot better and it takes like three weeks to feel back to where you were before you drank, not hung over. I don't get hung over, just tired. I don't have good energy. And so, um, you will find that it, that it does actually slow you down a lot, but obviously it's better to be carnivore with, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of whiskey on the weekends than, than, um, than just, you know, going to town on everything else as well. So question from Stefan uh, Bannett. Thank you very much for the super chat. Um, what are your thoughts on pregnenolone, DHEA, melatonin? Could any of the, them still be beneficial on carnivore? Could they be harmful on carnivore? I don't think they'll be harmful on carnivore um, unless you're just taking too much. Pregnenolone, DHEA uh, are both hormones. There's a, there's a sort of a, a, a uh, what is it? Oh, a spectrum of hormones You're starting from cholesterol and they turn into one hormone that turns into another and another and another and another and another. And then you get to testosterone, estrogen way down at the end of that chain. And um, so, you know, cortisol is in there, progesterone is in there, um, and DHEA and pregnenolone are in there. Um, they're all hormones in their own right, though. They're not just a, a reservoir for the next hormone down the, the chain, just like, you know, uh, you know, testosterone turns into estrogen, but testosterone isn't there just to turn into estrogen. It's there to do its own job. And so same goes for pregnenolone and DHEA. So if you're low on those things, and so and, and some people are um, even on a carnivore diet, I, I do check for things like DHEA. I don't I don't know tests for pregnenolone, but uh, maybe there's maybe that you can, um, but it would be sort of rare that a lab would do that. But you can get labs that will do DHEA. And what I see people go on a carnivore diet is, is their DHA actually comes up quite significantly and many get back to, you know, levels that you'd expect, you know, in your twenties and thirties. And so, you know, those people would not need to get, um, it would take DHEA. Um, so, you know, you can check, you know, if you've been on carnivore for a long time and you check your DHEA levels, um, you know, and, and you wanted to supplement, you could, I mean, it's, it's over the counter in most countries, uh, it's prescription here in Australia, but it's just, you can just, you know, get a GNC or off Amazon in America. Uh, I wouldn't take it unless you needed it though. Like anything else, you know, you don't want to be super physiological and these sorts of things. Um, especially for women, because this can convert into testosterone because DHEA turns into androstene, androstene turns into testosterone and then testosterone turns into estrogen. Um, but you know, some people do take this as like a, you know, a, uh, uh, part of like hormone replacement therapy um, or they just, you know, take it because it's, you know, it's over the counter. Um, so some people take it. I don't think it's harmful unless you, you're taking more than your body needs and you're sort of out, outside of the, the proper range, which obviously is above where the, the standard um, lab range would be. Um, melatonin is very safe. I don't, I don't know really any problems with that. One thing that melatonin can do is block cortisol. And so if you take too much, you just, it, sometimes it's hard to wake up in the morning. You don't have that cortisol boost in the morning and you just feel a bit groggy and tired. 
um, and it takes a bit longer to wake up, but it's not it's not harming you. Um, and it can help, you know, it can help sort of reset your circadian rhythm and help uh, your body produce growth hormone when you go to sleep uh, at, ma at, at optimal levels. And, um, you know, it sort of helps with your sleep-wake cycle. It's not the, you know, it's not like it's just a, this is going to make you fall asleep sort of drug. Um, it uh, is just, it's more about neuroprotection, hormonal regulation, and it's a, it's your brain's best antioxidant. So those are all good things. You know, people, the, you know, the dose for jet lag is like 60 milligrams. So that's a lot. A normal dose for uh, melatonin would be anywhere from, you know, three milligrams, five milligrams, 10 milligrams, you know, would be like a bigger dose. Um, and yet you can take 60 milligrams for jet lag. And, you know, I've done it. I've had like the best night's sleep of my life, you know, and, um, and uh, so that was, that was nice. So, you know, um, you can take things like that sometimes, but, you know, if you're doing well, if it helps you sleep and it, it, it helps you in those ways and helps you get over jet lag, I don't really see a problem taking things like that. I've done that occasionally. Um, I, I'll sometimes take melatonin if I actually know that I can get sleep and I want like good quality sleep. Um, but I sleep really well anyway, um, especially with like the sleep mask. So it's, um, um, yeah, it's just up to you really. I don't, I don't see too many problems with that as long as you're not taking uh, too much. Carnivore mom 81. Thank you for the super chat. I'm not seeing question. Oh, here's one here. Uh, well, thank you for the super chat again. Hi doc. Um, I'm in my fourth month of a meat diet. My magnesium looks like already depleted because too uh, many meds before. So can't absorb by taking uh, magnesium supplements. Is it fine to take probiotics to heal my gut first? I think we already did this question, didn't we? Um, uh, I mean, yeah. So, so again, um, you don't want to take the commercial probiotics. They've, they haven't been shown to really be any good and just a bit of a waste of money. Maybe can make things worse. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go with those. I'll go with just, um, uh, plain Greek yogurt with live cultures in it, um, with no carbs as little, or as little carbs as possible. And then you, uh, put that on meat, chew it up together with meat, swallow it together, and that can help uh, get your the bacteria down below uh, into your lower intestine. Matt Stassen, thank you for the super chat. Is carnivore okay if I have gallbladder, sludge, or gallstones? Yeah, so it, you get the gallbladder, sludge, and gallstones because you're not eating enough fat. And we're told, don't eat fat, don't eat fat, don't eat fat. Well, what happens then is your bile is there sitting there waiting in your gallbladder to absorb fat and you don't do it. So it actually gets more concentrated. So in you know physiology textbooks, you can say it can go up to 20 times the concentration of, uh, you know, uh, than when it comes out in your liver because it needs to be concentrated so that when you get a lot of um, fat, if it's, if it's like a week between, you know, kills or something like that, then you need to get, a, you need to get a lot of fat in one go. And so if you do that um, and you, and you concentrating that bile, um, you know, what happens to any hyper-concentrated solution at rest? It forms crystals, it forms precipitate. That's what gallstones are. That's what, uh, what bile sludge is. And so if you don't eat fat, those are going to get worse, guaranteed. Now, those stones might be big enough that they can cause a blockage, in which case you'll need, you'll need to get uh, intervention to get that taken out. Um, and so you need to be aware of that. You know, if you start having problems, you know, you need to get it checked out. Uh, if they're small enough or it's just sludge, you know, hopefully that can clear and pass safely. And then you can just sort of get rid of this stuff. A lot of people do. A lot of people have symptomatic gallbladders. They have sort of pain and sludge and little stones and things like that. They go carnivores, start eating a lot of fat and it clears up, but you need to be aware that if the stones are big enough, they can get stuck. But if you don't eat uh, enough fat, they're going to get bigger and they're definitely going to get stuck eventually. And you're going to have to get that taken out. So, um, you may be in, in a state that you can sort of reverse this. And I hope you are, um, if you don't, if you don't eat more fat, uh, like on a carnivore diet, it'll definitely get worse though. So you're sort of at that precipice and hopefully you can come back, but you know, it may still get stuck. You may still have to get surgery. So, you know, don't, um, you know, do go in, to the doctor or the hospital if you think there's something going on there and you need help, okay? Um, I'm 
Okay, so a question from Isabel B. Uh, how to gain weight? My 70-year-old father has been on carnivore diet for four months and is borderline anorexic. Please help. He needs to eat more. It's very easy to undereat on a carnivore diet, and this is very important, especially in the elderly, because uh, you're just not going to. Oh, I just, I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat that much. Have a couple of bites. Yeah, I'm fine. It's not about being fine. It's about eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. That is very, 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 very important. That's something that uh, my father unfortunately fell into. He was not eating enough because he just didn't feel hungry. And his whole life was about temperance. It was about mod, you know, moderating the amount that he ate so that, you know, he could stay healthy because he was, you know, concerned, you know, he wanted to be healthy. And so it was just like, no, I don't need to eat anymore. I feel fine. And so that's what he was doing. He's just like, he doesn't feel hungry. He's not going to eat, you know, he's not going to eat all that much. And so, you know, he lost a lot of weight, which was healthy. And then he kept losing weight, which was not healthy. So I'd impress upon him, hey, you need to eat and uh, you have to eat every day like it's your job and so you know when i go back there sort of once a year once every two years um i sort of try to you know reinstill this with them and uh, if my sister's listening please go tell them again eat like it's your job and eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good that's what that's what the hunger signal is is the taste if it tastes good you're still hungry you need to keep eating get a lot of fat the brain's made out of fat you need fat. Your hormones are made out of fat, uh, cholesterol specifically. And so they need that. And so get all of that and they will be uh, much healthier and they'll be able to put on weight. Your seven-year-old father will be able to put on muscle if he eats enough fatty meat and exercises. You can put on, you can put on muscle at any age as long as you eat right and, uh, and exercise. Good luck to that. Stags, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, been carnivore uh, for three months. I want to get lean and struggling with my weight going up. Uh, definitely know it's body fat. I eat all meats, red meat, eggs, chicken, fish, etc. How can I find a balance? Um, well, again, you know this is this is, this can be hormonal and this can be metabolic, and so you need to just let your body heal from these sorts of things and let your metabolism recover as well. It can take a long time. And uh, it's it's rare that people put on weight, but it does happen. Um, Kelly Hogan has a great in, um, discussion with Charles Washington, who's uh, been, you know, carnivore what, 15, 20 years almost. And uh, he's, in, he's um, in charge of the Zeroing In on Health Facebook group, which is a carnivore Facebook group. Before it was called carnivore, it was called Zero Carb. And so there's a lot of zeroing in on health, zero carb health. Those are two great Facebook groups. And so he um, he and Kelly Hogan talk about this. I and mean, people put on weight. She put on weight for like six months. And some of that can be muscle. And some of it almost certainly is muscle after three months. But um, some of it can be fat. You have to you know check your leptin, check your fasting insulin that after three months, your fasting insulin is probably okay, but your leptin may not be. And that can be a sign that your metabolism is still depressed and you just need to eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Eat more fat than pro than protein. You'll bring in less grams into your body and you'll get more energy from the fat and you bring in less weight and less, less grams into your body. Um, and so you can just eat until your body's satiated. If you're under eating, you're going to slow your metabolism. So just keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Um, and just give it time, you know, eventually it'll, it'll sort it, it'll sort it out. If this keeps going on and you're still worried about it, get your leptin check, get your thyroid check, get your, um, nutrients and hormones checked, your B12, all these sorts of things. Make sure you're not missing something that is holding you back and, um, you know, add in a bit of liver, you know, hide you know, your body tracks nutrients. It doesn't track calories. Right. And so if you're eating more high nutrient density things, like a bit more liver, like you're just not going to eat as much because you're not going to be as hungry because your body's going to be satisfied of those nutrients quicker. And, um, you know, so just keep that in mind as well and, and you'll be fine. Just keep going, cut out everything else, any dairy gone, any artificial sweetener gone. All those things are, are major uh, weight loss stalls, and so uh, you don't want to don't want those in your body. The Claim Squad public adjusters, thank you for the super chat. 
Hi, Dr. Chafee, you've been following you for a year now. I'm active and eat fruit and honey after working out. Are you still not in favor of fruit and honey? Eh, not a big fan. Um, I don't think you need them. I certainly don't think you need, it's interesting you're doing that after working out. Some people do it before working out, just to give them that bit of a, of a hit and a buzz. Um, and um, you know, if you're doing it after you're working out, uh, you don't you don't need that to you know drive in muscle like yeah that that will technically raise your insulin insulin is anabolic and insulin does you know um, help drive protein into your muscles um, but it's it's anabolic you know anabolic isn't just about muscle growth it's also about just growth in general fat growth so you're gonna you're gonna you're just gonna put on fat as well um, you'll put on muscle but you also put on fat and you don't you don't need the the insulin boost from carbs to to drive protein into your muscles you're already designed for that and so if you, you just eat fatty meat after you work out you know you're going to get a bit of an insulin bump because protein will slightly raise your insulin as well and that will drive that protein into the cells it'll be perfectly fine you have plenty of insulin you don't need to to micromanage it by eating carbohydrates or certainly not taking exogenous carb uh, um, um insulin which some bodybuilders do which i think is a really bad idea um, bodybuilders, power lifters, you know, just people trying to put on muscle. Um, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I have a, I have a, uh, video on YouTube called fruit and honey are not carnivore. I still, uh, I still hold to that. And I, I think that you'd be better off not doing that. Um, see how you go, you know, try it for a month and see how you feel and see what your results are. You know, remember that, that, um, you know, when you raise your carbohydrates or raise your insulin, it's going to look like your muscles are bigger, but a lot of that's going to be excess glycogen, which draws in water. There's two molecules of water come in for every molecule of glycogen. Right? So you have more glycogen in your muscle. You're going to have more water in your muscle. It's going to look bigger. That's not muscle. That's just, that's water, right? Um, that's just, you know, dead space, right? But you're also going to put down fat. It's called myosteatosis. This is what marbling is on cows. And we see this on MRIs all the time. Well, everybody has myosteatosis. It's pathological. It's always pathological. And so when you're eating this stuff, you're going to, you're going to, oh, my muscles are getting bigger. Well, no, there's going to be intramuscular fats and myosteatosis, right? And you're going to have glycogen and water. So your muscles may look bigger, but as soon as you go keto, shrink down, oh, I lost all this muscle. You haven't lost any muscle. You didn't have it in the first place, right? It was fat, Glycogen, water weight, inflammation, and that's gone. You don't want that. You want lean body mass. You want lean muscle mass. You want real muscle, real strength, real weight, and and that's how you get it is just by just eating meat, just eating fatty meat, and exercising, and um, you know you'll be great. You'll you'll do a great job, and um, uh, there'll be you know no issues uh, with that. And so that's, that's my, my opinion anyway. And, and, um, I think you'll do, uh, much better without it and enjoy it more too. I mean, you know, sugar's, sugar's pleasant to eat, you know, and, and we enjoy that for the experience of it, but food is about, you know, getting nutrition. It's not about enjoyment. You can enjoy, I've enjoyed every steak that I've ever eaten, but that's not why I eat it. Right. It's because I want proper nutrition. That's why I eat it. Cats are nice meow. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. Is there a concern of mRNA in meat sold at stores? I mean, there's a concern because we have no idea what the hell it's going to do. And we don't know what these people are doing. They've lied to us. We have no idea um, if they're going to be putting these things in there, if it's trying to inoculate us through the food, if certainly something they've spoken about, trying to make GMO plants and, and vegetables that actually produce sort of mRNA sort of uh, things in it. And uh, so who knows? Who knows what the hell this stuff is? So yes, I mean, it's definitely a concern because we don't know what the hell they're doing. We don't know why they're doing it. And we don't know what the consequences will be because we've never done it, right? If you have something new, you can't just experiment on the world. That That's what the Geneva Convention is about. You don't get to do that. So until you know what this does in long-term studies, you don't just get to roll this out to the public. That is, uh, that's a human rights violation and it's strictly against the Geneva Convention. Uh, so yes, uh, those would be my concerns on that. We have no idea what the hell this is going to do. Could be fine. Could be a miracle to, to modern civilization, but we don't know that. And so unless you test that in 
in appropriate ways, not just testing it on the public and, and destroying people's lives, potentially. Uh, you can't do that. You can't say that. And so you can't trust it. Definitely can't. Okay. Uh, Victoria Scott, thank you for the super chat. Um, I'm not seeing a question. Let me see if it's down here more. I'm not. Hmm. Not seeing one. Okay. Um, well, if it, if it comes up, um, I'll try and catch it. But uh, thank you in, in any case. Damian Williams, thank you for the super chat. Um, Damien says, thank you for your amazing content. Um, you've helped me uh, to refine my carnivore lifestyle. My example and your videos uh, have inspired my older brother, and he is now turning his health around. So thank you. That's really great to hear. I'm really, um, thank you very much for, for that. And thank you very much for sharing that. Um, that's amazing. I really appreciate that. I'm really, I'm really glad that my videos have helped. It's sort of funny to think that my videos help anybody. Um, it's just, you know, there's things that I think about and things that I've come across and things that I've found to be useful in my life and in, in the life and health of my patients and my family. And I think it's important that people know about these things and, uh, and, and have the tools available to them to be healthy and not just sit around in misery and just, you know, get put on more and more medications and have, have worse and worse outcomes. I just, I just, you know, obviously we're going in the wrong direction that way. So something has to change. And I'm really glad that people have been able to find this and, and be brave enough to give it a try. You know, so you see these people going, Oh, this is, this is garbage and all that sort of stuff. And they're saying all these things. They never tried it. They have no idea. You know, they're, they're too close minded to actually look at the evidence with an open mind and actually think about things and have a discussion. They just, they just want you to be wrong because people like being right. You know, they like feeling like an authority, you know, if they don't have much power and control in their, in their own life, they feel a bit, you know, um, you know, battered around and, and they don't feel like they have a lot of control over things in their life or a lot of authority in their life. You know, they see something like this and go, oh, that's bullshit. It's calories in, calories out. Oh, plants, you have to do that. Everyone knows this. Now they're an authority on something and now they get to tell you for sure. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's understandable. It's, it's just part of human nature, but it, it closes them off to something that could actually really help them. And it's sad. It's sad to see that. I don't get mad at them. You know, unless someone's like, you know, overtly rude to someone, you know, then that, that pisses me off. But then I'll say something about it. But you know, if people are just closed minded. It's I actually just feel bad for them that they're not they're not willing to try something new and think about something in a different way. They could potentially that will. There's, not even, there's no potential about it. They will completely dramatically change their lives and their health in a revolutionary sort of ways. So thank you, Damien, for for that. Thank you for trying this out. And thank you for sharing this with your brother and and helping him as well. You understand your ripple effects on every single one of you is is so much more broad than you realize. Um, you know, I only have the reach that I have because you all have influenced people around you. And you've sent these videos to other people and you've talked to them about it and you've tried it yourself and you've had uh, great results with it. And other people have seen that and say, what are you doing again? What's that about? You know, and, and um, you know, can you send me some resources on it? That's the only reason that I have the reach that I have is because you all have influenced, have, have been brave enough to try this yourself. And that has influenced people around you to try for themselves. That's the only reason. This is not me doing it. I'm not doing anything. You know, you all are doing this. It's your reach that's having an effect. And so thank you all for doing that and being brave enough to try this and to, and to be that example for people in your family and in your, in your spheres to, uh, to just give it, be that beacon of hope and say, Whoa, Dave is looking great. What, what the hell happened, Dave? You lost like a hundred pounds. It's like, yeah, I've just been doing this meat diet. Isn't that crazy? I feel great off all my blood pressure medications, I'm not diabetic anymore. I'm going to the gym and uh, everything's great in my life, you know? And so, you know, people see that and they, they want that for themselves. And so, you know, uh, thank you all for being open-minded enough. I, most people in here have come from like a vegan vegetarian background and they've been sick and they've been unwell and it's in like, okay, this isn't working. What the hell else is going on? The intentions are there. You know, the good intentions are there. You want the right thing for your, yourself and your family, for the planet, for the animals, all these things we're all on the same page about. 
Um, and then you realize like, okay, you know, doing it, it with a vegan diet, actually that doesn't actually help me or the planet or the animals as much as I thought it did. Um, this can do it better. So, you know, please, you know, if anybody else has had you know similar experiences, please write down in the comments, you know, let us know what sort of issues you help. You know, did you, were you coming from a vegan background or a vegetarian background or a plant-based background or a sad background? Most people say the only benefits that people get from carnivores is because they go from a standard processed food diet and they cut out the processed food and they go meat-based, which is just projection. Like that's the only benefit that you get from going vegan is if you cut out the, the processed food. It's not cutting out the meat. That doesn't give any benefits to anybody ever at all, any time. Um, it's cutting out the other garbage and they have that honeymoon period where they feel a bit better and they cut out alcohol and cigarettes and sugar and all that sort of stuff. And they think, oh, got rid of meat and I'm feeling great. No, you got rid of crap and then you're feeling great. Unfortunately, you threw the baby out with the bathwater. So please, Leave a comment if that was you. You know, see what you come, you know, where you came from. Um, you know, they say like, oh, only people coming from a standard processed food diet. I'm like, no, that's not it. There's people doing vegan, vegetarian, plant based diets, um, or just eating uh, like a like a healthy, clean, omnivorous diet, and they cut out the plants, and it just revolutionizes their health. And uh, that happened for me. That's happened for my family. That's happened for my patients. And that's happening for hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people around the world now. So please uh, let us know in the comments. You know, were you were you um, from the standard food diet, or were you from the plant based diet, or where did you come from? Because I think a lot of this is uh, people coming from uh, healthy diets, um, or that they thought were healthy diets, and um, did as hard as they could. You know, did everything they could to be healthy, and then you know they weren't. They weren't as healthy as they could be. They did. They went to a meat-based diet, animal-based diet, carnivore diet, and they became healthy then. So, you know, do let people know and let everyone else know. Like, hey, it's not just cutting out processed foods that's that's uh, the benefit. It's just it's just going to meat and cutting out everything else. Every, all these other things can cause harm. It's not just processed foods. And processed foods are plants anyway. They're all processed plant foods, you know. And uh, and always remember that the most rigorously studied diet on earth with the highest levels of evidence, with randomized controlled trials, with interventional trials in both humans and animals is the ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet is just cutting out carbs. What do you replace carbs with? You replace it with fat and protein, but where? You could do that on vegetarian diet, but they don't. It's almost next to impossible to do that safely and effectively. And so they don't. The ketogenic diet uh, in these studies that they study, that they test is replacing carbs with meat, with animal fat, with animal protein. So it's a meat-based diet. So everyone says, oh, there's no evidence for this carnivore diet. Bullshit. It's the most rigorously studied diet on earth, and it's been shown to be the most effective and healthy diet on earth, be dash diet head-to-head, and it has for specific medical outcomes like diabetes, Alzheimer's, um, autoimmunity, and many others, this shows significant clinical benefit in humans when they go on to a high-fat, animal-based diet with a side salad, maybe if they want it. It's a carnivore diet light, carnivore with a side salad, but it's a ketogenic carnivore diet with some veggies if you want them, which I don't, and I, I think you'd do better without them. So the most rigorously studied diet, the most beneficial diet ever studied in the literature is a whole food, high fat, animal based diet. That's what's in the literature. Don't ever forget that, and don't let people uh, try to say like, "Oh, there's no, there's no high level studies." First of all, there's no high level studies for a plant based diet. Second of all, the only th diet that has thousands of high level studies is the animal based ketogenic diet. Always remember that. Don't give people an inch on that because it's garbage. Jim Coffee, uh, Jim Coffee the second. Thank you very much for the super chat. Hey Doc, as a carnivore mindful of calorie intake, I'm considering whey protein powder to balance protein without excess calories. Your insights. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. You know, again, calories don't weigh anything, right? So uh, you want you're worried about grams. So you want to bring in less grams, right? You want the same calories, less grams. Um, you have two glasses of water. One is hot, one is cold. Cold one has less calories than the hot one. Does that weigh less than the hot one? No, they weigh exactly the same for the exact same amount of uh, milliliters of water because, you know, grams have weight, 
calories don't have weight. So again, it's calories per gram. It's actually grams per calories. You get one gram per nine calories of fat, or you get three grams per nine calories for protein, for getting energy from protein. And the vast majority of, of the protein that you're eating is going to be used for your, for you know, to make molecules in your body anyway. So that's not being used as energy. So um, I, I wouldn't use whey protein powder. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, yeah, I mean, it's, you want whole foods, right? So just try to eat naturally, try to eat meat. Um, I mean, if you really wanted to eat leaner meat, you could, but you're going to eat more of it because your body does need energy. And, and to get the same amount of calories, you're going to need to eat three times as much lean meat as, you know, fat, right? So um, I would just focus on uh, fatty meat. You will actually eat less and you'll actually lose more weight um, in that regard. And so if you have the same amount of calories, if you're getting more of those calories from fat, you'll bring less grams and grams are what weigh something. Calories don't. Um, it's a comment from The Real Deal says, um, so much appreciate how much I've learned uh, from you over the last 20 months. Uh, Anthony Chafee, um, MD, and you continue to be a veritable fountain of, of valuable information. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Um, Zanel Cat, thank you for the super chat. Serious question. What does carnivore diet, why does carnivore diet make my JJ have a weird smell? How can it be remedied? I don't know. Um, I don't know that it does. I don't know that that's, that's what's causing that it could just be coincidental. Um, but you know, the thing is too, is that, you know, when you're eating different, differently, your body can have swap out sort of the microbiome, just sort of the oral biome is going to change your colonic microbiome and your lower intestine is going to change. And that can also affect the biome in your VJJ potentially. So, um, possibly something to do with that. Um, but, uh, I'm not too sure that's, that's definitely a new one. So, um, think about other reasons why that could be, could be the case. Um, and, um, you know, if you are concerned about it as well, you know, do see your OBGYN to, to see if there's, there's something else going on, but I don't, I don't think that it's going to, that doing a carnivore diet will harm you in any way from a, from a biome point of view or any other point of view. And so I would expect it to just help. Maybe there's just a bit of a balancing act your body's doing at the moment, and that's causing hormones to change a bit. I mean, that does happen. I mean, you're going to have, you can have disruptions in your cycle as well. Um, sometimes women have irregular cycles for um, a few months uh, after starting a carnivore diet, and then it sort of stabilizes off for about four or five months. Um, and that's just your hormones are just sort of getting into balance. And uh, so that can change things around that can that can actually change um, the, the smell of uh, everything as well. So maybe that's it too. That should if that's what's happening, then that'll stabilize on its own, that'll sort of sort itself out. And, um, you know, any concerns, then you know, just see your OB and uh, or yeah, gynecologist really, and see, um, you know, see if they have any reason to suspect there's something going on. And if they think, yeah, no, look, it's fine. And I just give it time and, and hopefully it just sorts itself out. Uh, RJG, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, A1C is 8.5 as of three weeks ago, carnivore for three weeks now. Um, have noticed my blood glucose drops significantly after I eat, but if I fast, it stays high. Should I start eating breakfast to drop my glucose faster in the morning? Hmm, that's interesting. You know, um, actually, it's, it's sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes when people will have a bit of a bump in their blood sugar um, after they eat. Um, it's you know not a not a major one, but but a slight one. Um, are you taking any insulin with your meals? Because obviously, if you're taking insulin with meals, that's going to drop that as well. Um, so think about that also. Um, don't just eat just so you can take more insulin. Um, and think about, you know, what medications you're on for your, for your blood sugar and your diabetes. And, uh, remember that at some point you're going to need to start weaning off of these things. So you need to work with your, uh, diabetes care team, uh, to safely do that and come down. So you're not uh, getting too low. 
but see how you go. You know, if uh, all, all else being equal, if you're just eating, you're not taking medication and that's just your blood sugar is dropping a bit. Sure. If that's, if that makes you feel better, if that makes you feel good and that's giving you better results, you can try it out. I mean, I, I, I still think you just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. You do that as many times as your body requires you during the day. And I think you just go with that. I think that's the main thing um, is, is doing that. If, if you're having a, a remarkable difference in your blood sugar, then maybe it's worth doing that. But you're also trying to lay down a pattern of behavior so that you can do this ongoing and you can do this for a long time. And, um, and so, um, you know, if you do that, um, what was I going to say? If you, if you, if you sort of eat in this pattern of just eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good and, and eat as many times as your body is asking you for, then you get in, into that pattern ongoing. And then when you sort of reverse your diabetes and all these other sorts of issues, and you're at a stable weight, you're still used to um, doing that. You're still used to eating in, in a specific pattern, and uh, and that's going to be that healthy pattern long term. But see how you go. If it's making like really a dramatic difference and it's not medication related. Sure, you know, see see how that uh, affects you, and and go from there. But yeah, good luck. It's already you know, it's great to see that you're you're already getting uh, better uh, blood sugar control, even with um, you know only three weeks in. So that's really good. Um, just looking at the time here, everyone probably need to um, stop the super chats. I only have about fifty minutes left, and we've got a number of super chats left. So uh, let's probably just cut those there. Um, if people can, um, uh, yeah, probably we'll just try to get through all the rest of the super chats because there's actually a number of them and, um, and, uh, maybe just leave it there and, um, and I'll try to get to all of these, uh, as best I can. And, um, and, uh, if I don't get to any, any of these, I'll, I'll try to get on the next one, but I'll, I should be able to, I should be able to get to all of them, but I'll. I will need to leave uh, at some point because I have uh, patients this afternoon. Um, John Kinsley, um, actually, Mike, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause real quick just to let a little boy out of the room. So he's 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 being patient. One second. Okay. Oh, gosh. Uh, so John Kinsley, thank you for the super chat. Um, John says, my mom was recently diagnosed with diverticulitis. Her doctor said, avoid red meat and eat lots of fiber, <laughs> including taking Metamucil daily. Could you please explain if that information is incorrect? I, I certainly disagree with it anyway. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have spoken to, you know, colorectal surgeons who are just like, yeah, absolutely not. That's not what you should do for people. Um, and, uh, and a lot of colorectal surgeons that are now carnivore and recommending carnivore to their patients and, um, and for all the reasons that we, we discussed, um, red meat does not cause diverticulitis. It does not cause diverticulosis. It does not cause any health issue or ramification in your entire body at any point, any time for anybody, anywhere. Um, diverticulitis is, is, uh, infection of, of, uh, damaged colon. Uh, they can have these outpouchings called diverticulae, um, and uh, that's called diverticulosis. And then when that that's a sort of weakened stretched tissue, and that's easier to get a bit of a tear, and that can get infected, and that gets diverticulitis, which can be very dangerous. What happens? What happens when you when you get diverticulitis? Um, exactly the opposite. I have never actually heard a colorectal surgeon say that when you have diverticulitis, you should eat more fiber. Uh, in fact, they say the exact opposite. They say go on a, on a low residue or, or no residue diet, right? Residue being fiber, residue being things that you have to pass through your bowels because you can't absorb it because it's useless and you shouldn't have eaten it in the first place. Like if you swallowed, you know, like a toy figurine, that's just going to come out, right? Well, why? Uh, because it's not food, right? And so your body doesn't want it, doesn't need it, and it has to pass it out. 
right? Uh, that's the same with fiber. Fiber is useless to your body. Uh, and in fact, it can cause harm. There were studies, there was a study with uh, over 2,000 patients they did uh, col um, colonoscopies for, and they found, and they looked at all sorts of different metrics, and they found the only associations uh, with div developing diverticulosis was more fiber in the diet and more bowel motions, um, like more than 15 a week on average, right? So just over two a day on average. Um, that's the only thing that they found. Constipation was not a factor. Meat was not a factor. Fat was not a factor. None of those things were factors, just fiber and increased bowel motions. You're overworking the organ and you're going into organ failure. You're going into colon failure. You overwork your heart. You get heart failure. It gets baggy and, and worn out and it doesn't work as well. Now you get that with your colon as well. So that's the problem. All right. Um, so no, I, I completely disagree with that. And in fact, uh, for diverticulitis, for, for an acute presentation of that, that actually is, uh, that is strictly contraindicated of having a high fiber diet. That's exactly what you don't do. When patients come into the hospital with diverticulitis, they say, don't eat fiber. You eat a low fiber diet. So uh, no. And then they, and then they, you know, get better and they go home and they say, okay, now get back to a high fiber diet. Like, Okay. But avoid nuts and seeds and all these things that can get stuck in the diverticulae and maybe tear them and all that sort of stuff. So it's just it's just they have this counter, um, you know, uh, these count these messages going counter to each other. But I have never heard someone say that uh, they should eat more fiber when they have diverticulitis actively. I've never heard that. And so no, that's wrong, and that's that's strictly against the um, even the conventional. Uh, guidelines for dealing with diverticulitis. And um, and I would certainly say um, trying to avoid diverticulitis, you want to follow the same same rules of don't eat any fiber because it's just going to make things worse. And we're designed to eat meat. Red meat does not cause any problems, certainly not in your bowel. Um, so no, the doctor's uh, full of crap. <laughs> Mike M, thank you for the super chat. Being carnivore for and had blood stun, HbA1c 5.1, LDL 7.6, HDL 1.5, triglycerides 0 0.9, fasting insulin 3. Fantastic. Why would my insulin be so low and is it healthy? Thanks for all you do. Your insulin is low because you, you don't require anymore because your body's making the amount that your body requires. Fasting insulin 3 is fantastic. Um, there's different ranges that people would, would talk about, but um, you know, speaking to... to um, Casey Means, Dr. Casey Means, um, who I had on my podcast, um, uh, she has a company called Levels where they, they try to address metabolic health. Her, her brother is uh, Callie Means, who's uh, been made a lot of headlines recently because he's, he's been a whistleblower for the um, – you know, food, big food and big pharma companies showing that like these guys know that they're causing harm. They know they're hurting people and, um, and they are, are happy because they're profiting from it. And he said, you know, paraphrasing, but he said, he said, I know they know this because I've been in the boardroom meetings with them when they said it. Right. So, um, she has a company where they're just looking at insulin, fasting insulin and, and blood sugar and CGMs and all that sort of stuff. Uh, called levels and people can check out that that interview that we did. She's a very interesting, bright lady, and um, and she was saying that the range they use is optimal as I think something like two to six or two to seven or something like that. Mine is like three point five, you know. So no, you're 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 fine. You know that's where that's what your body wants. There's going to be fluctuation. That's fasting insulin. So you eat protein or you eat a big meal. That insulin's going to come up a bit. You know, because you know, it, it is uh, uh, protein is insulinogenic to a, to a degree. It's not massive, but uh, to a degree, it does because you know you want a bit of insulin to force that that protein into cells or or help transport it into cells. Uh, so no, I think that's perfectly fine. I think all your numbers are absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, your HDL is nice and high. Triglycerides are nice and low. LDL higher LDL is associated with with longevity. So you know all those things are all all winners uh, from what I can see. And uh, I should say as well, um, there was a study out of Sweden last year with forty four thousand patients that uh, participants looking at blood results and looking at at uh, blood markers to say what were what were the best biomarkers blood markers that people could use to predict. 
um, predict living over 100 or, or increase your chances of living over 100 in longevity. And I found the two best biomarkers were um, low fasting insulin and high total cholesterol. So you're right there. So I think you're doing you're doing really well from a health and longevity point of view, just from those two markers anyway. S. Golagen, uh, 90, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Anthony, do you think mainstream nutritionists and scientists will one day advocate for a carnivore diet and why? I do, because a lot of them are coming around to that because that's what the evidence shows and suggests and recommends. Um, the nutritionists now, the curriculum is a plant-based dogma based on the work of a Seventh-day Adventist church who still controlled the curriculum. They founded the curriculum. They founded the nutritional sciences and nutritional um, academia and um, the, the, the American Nutritional Dietetics Association was founded by the Seventh-day Adventist church member, Lena Cooper. So um, it's just a matter of un undoing that crap. But, you know, more and more nutritionists are graduating with a degree in nutrition from an Ivy League school, and they're doing exactly what they're told to do from their their uh, classes. They should be perfect health, perfect nutrition, and they're not, and they're sick, and they're fat, and they're dying. You know, some, you know, some people like um, Sally Norton, she has a degree in nutrition from Cornell, and uh, she was plant-based, vegetarian, vegan, because that's what she was taught, and she was doing all of that, and she nearly died from the oxalates and plant toxins that were in the food that she was eating. And she was like, can't do that. So she's come around. She's nearly all carnivore. Um, and, um, uh, you know, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, she has a PhD in nutrition and she was doing everything exactly the way that she was taught to do it. And she was not healthy and she was getting worse. And she started going like, well, hang on a second. I'm doing everything right. And things aren't, things aren't working right. Things aren't working the way I was told they would. So what's going on? And she looked into it and found like, this was all crap. And now she's carnivore, right? And she's doing a lot better as a result of that. And now she's teaching that in her classes uh, at university. And so um, I think it will come around. There's more and more people coming around to this. More and more nutritionists and dietitians are coming around to this. More and more PhD students and PhD candidates are coming to this. And they're doing their research in the carnivore diet and in the meat-based diets and animal-based diets. And so I think it absolutely will come around because the truth will out. And this, these are facts. If humans are carnivores. That's just the kind of animal we are. And no animal is going to do better eating an, an alternate diet than the one that they are biologically adapted for by definition, right? So that goes for us as well. And so, you know, you don't need a study to tell you what an animal eats. You just go out in the wild and you look at what they eat. Right. And you give them something else and they get sick. It's not that hard. Right. Um, you do that with humans. What do you do? You go out with the Inuit. They're just eating meat. OK. Historically, what do we eat before? The, well, we know we know what people were eating up until the agricultural revolution and then beyond. Right. And so we have clear records of this and we have clear records in the um, stable isotope studies and and um, and, uh, and just the historical record and then the prehistorical fossil record, you know, we have clear evidence there too. So it's, it's not, it's not unclear what humans have been eating since we've been humans and how we've changed over the, over the millennia and how massively uh, that's, d that's damaged our health and development. Our brains have shrank by 11% for men, 17% for women overnight. It didn't take hundreds of years or thousands of years. It was night and day, pre-agriculture, post-agriculture, bam. And that's persisted until today. But happened in all the d different places that they independently went to agriculture. They shrank by five, six inches. The brains got smaller. Their teeth got crooked and crowded. They had a whole bunch of, of health issues and abnormalities to, and signs of chronic disease to the skeletons. And so that happened independently everywhere you look in the fossil record or in the anthropological record when it happened more recently, like with the Native Americans and Native Australians, when they got converted over to a more Western plant-based diet because they were forced to um, stop eating their, their traditional food, either by wiping out the bison or being torn off their land here in Australia and, and forced into British schools and, and go uh, and, and become involved in British society. You know, like that's, that, that completely damaged um, entire generations of people. And we see clear disparities, you know, between uh, the before and after, right? So this isn't, it's not hard. We know what we're supposed to eat. We don't, you don't need a damn nutritional stu study or scientist for this. And people are seeing that. 
And so nutritionists are seeing that and nutrition students are seeing that and going like, because they want to know actual nutrition. They don't want to be like, oh, I want to be indoctrinated. I want to do what they're doing. No, they want to know nutrition. They want to know what's right for the human body to eat. They want to know how to, to help resolve health issues with nutritional methods and in interventions. They don't, they don't want to just, you know, have a degree, you know, most people don't, they want to actually know what the hell is going on. And so that's why they're doing this. And when you see this for yourself, you're like, yep, that's not it. And so uh, it is turning. And when we, we uncover why this has been um, kept from us for so long, uh, I think it pisses people off, it certainly pisses me off. And so that's, we just need to get that out there that, you know, we've been duped, you know, we've been had for these religious ideological reasons. And, uh, and those, those, those reasons have not left, you know, it's not just, this was pushed out in the 1800s and now it's just sort of self-perpetuating. No, they are still actively trying to push a vegan ideology on the world because of their own religious ideology. And that's not to say anything about the individuals in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, I know a lot of Seventh Day Adventist Church members. They're lovely people. They're just normal people, right? It's the 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 powers that be that are in charge that are pushing this doctrine, um, because that's their whole tenets was was then their and their whole self identity was about um, you know getting getting rid of meat and things like that. And they push on the blue zone studies. I mean, they paid for that. Dan Butner is a Seventh Day Adventist Church member, and then he sold the rights to the blue zones to the Seventh Day Adventist Church for like seventy million dollars. Right? This is this is a scam. And, uh, and people are coming around to this, and that includes nutrition students and, and current nutritionists um, who are in charge of doing the research and in charge of teaching the next generation of, of nutrition students. So, uh, yes, I do think it will, will come around. It already is. Andrew, thank you for the super chat. Carnivore for three months. Over the past three days, I've had six migraines, uh, mostly aura, very little headache follows. Uh, seems to be triggered by screens. Any ideas? Um, you know, avoid screens. Obviously, that's that's a low hanging fruit. Um, be as as strict as you possibly can be with the carnivore diet. It's not going to cure all migraines for everybody, but there's a hundred years of data and literature on ketogenic carnivore diets, right? Because a ketogenic diet is basically very close to a carnivore diet. It's a meat based high fat animal fat diet uh, with no carbs and you know vegetables if you want to but why would you want to I don't know and so you know they they help and I find that people are more helped by getting rid of the the vegetables as well so you're you can still get triggers there are, there can be other triggers for migraines sunlight screens, other sorts of things that can trigger them. So you just try to avoid all your triggers. So you've already removed a lot of triggers from your food. That's great. Um, you know, if you're having coffee, things like that, get rid of that crap because that that's a major trigger for migraines as well. Dehydration is a major trigger for migraines. It's actually the most common cause of headaches of any description is dehydration. So make sure you're getting enough water. Make sure you're eating enough. Make sure you're eating enough fat. You want high ketones uh, because that can help suppress uh, uh, headaches and migraines in particular and epilepsy as well. And, um, and then the screens just get, get the hell away from the screens. You know, maybe blue blocking glasses will help, uh, with that or blue filter on your phone or screens. Maybe that can help as well. But if they're triggering migraines, just avoid them, you know, maybe that, that forces you to, to go back to reading books and actually becoming intelligent again and getting off these damn social media things and, and just surfing all day. And, doing that nonsense, you know, because that, that's just like the bane of my life right now. I haven't, you know, uh, been able to get off, get off these things because I'm just, you know, it's just part of my work. I have to answer a bunch of messages and put posts up and things like that. But then you get sucked into that. And then you're just, you're just, so you just, I have to do something. I have to do something. So I'm always on there looking, I always have messages to answer and things like that. But, um, you know, just get away from that. You know, you don't want to be on there anyway. And so if you can get away from screens, your brain will be better for it. You'll be better for it. Your hormones will be better for it. Your health will be better for it. And it sounds like your migraines will be better for it too. So maybe just take that as a sign to, you know, just get back to living like uh, humans are supposed to live and getting away from all these screens and stuff. Dylan Verrett, thank you for the super chat. I uh, have two patches of eczema on my hips and... Um, 
that sendingly will not go away or seemingly I'm, a, I'm assuming will not go away. Did strict carnivore for two months with no improvements, any thoughts? Um, we'll keep going. Um, you want to be, um, 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 you know, keep going with it. Be very strict, just red meat and water. You need to be very strict, uh, red meat and water, nothing else, no coffee, tea, sweeteners, dairy, eggs, anything like that uh, with autoimmune issues or rashes or the eczemas and psoriasis. All these sorts of things are very sensitive. And so you need to be as strict as you can. Also, um, something that's interesting that I've, that I've spoken to a number of people about when they have real, um, uh, you know, sort of trouble eczema or psoriasis is uh, using tallow, beef tallow as a moisturizer and just rubbing that into your skin. Best moisturizer you'll ever find in your entire life. It's absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and your skin will just be glowing as a result of that. So uh, try that and put that on the eczema, put that on your body and, and uh, just red meat and water only, nothing, nothing, nothing else. And hopefully it clears up. Sometimes it gets... It's, it can be very stubborn and it can take a while. Sometimes you're, you're losing fat and you can be releasing toxins from your fat that can exacerbate the eczema or cause other sorts of weird rashes, sometimes people call it like a keto rash, all that sort of stuff, it's just from losing fat and releasing fat, uh, toxins. So, um, you know, try all those things and hopefully that clears up. It does for most people. Sometimes they have a bit more stubborn case. So just keep that in mind. Laura Smith, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. I'm 68 year old female, five foot three, hundred pounds. I feel great, but I look too thin. Keto for seven months. Uh, would like to gain a little weight. What are your recommendations? I uh, just just eat a lot. Eat a lot of meat. You got to eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good, and uh, try to do some uh, resistance exercises if you can. Try to do um, sprinting if you can. I don't know um, if what your your physical uh, status is. But if you're able to sort of get out and walk, do that. If you're able to run, try to skip straight to sprinting, obviously only if it's safe for you. Uh, what you can also do is you can go on like an exercise bike, like a stationary bicycle, and you can do sprints on there. And um, uh, and that can do the same things. You're just going hard as you can for as long as you can and you just wear yourself out. If you can go longer than 30, 30 40 seconds, maybe not working as hard as you could, and you just really try to wear yourself out and um, catch your breath. Do it again. Try that ten times, twice a week. You'll you'll stimulate a lot of uh, a lot of healthy changes in your body as well as muscle growth. Try resistance training, either body weight exercises or resistance bands or or weights or whatever that's suitable for you. Going to failure, you know that's how you're going to stimulate muscle growth. And then you eat, you eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good, you eat twice a day to see, uh, to make sure you're satisfying your body's ability or your body's demand for, uh, nutrition and putting on muscle and you'll, you'll put on weight, but you want to put on healthy weight. You want to put on fat then eat carbs. If you want to put on healthy weight, then you just eat a, enough meat. It's very easy to under eat on a carnivore diet. I can't stress that enough. And so you need to make sure you're getting enough. Just keep going until it stops tasting good. Do it twice a day at the very least, and more if your body needs it. TKM7211, uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, hi, Dr. Chafee. What is your opinion on some chicken liver pate or foie gras from time to time? I can't stomach beef liver, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, liver, uh, uh, you know, any any sort of liver is fine. You know, the pates are going to have a whole bunch of other stuff added in. If you make your own pate, and you only put in salt and things like that, go for it. I, I tend to avoid foie gras because it's just pretty cruel the way they, um, uh, you know, feed the, the ducks and the geese, you know, it's, it's tube down their throat, you know, it's really uncomfortable and you're just dumping grains down them. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily all the healthy fats. It, it, um, it's fatty liver causes fatty liver. And then we're wondering what causes fatty livers in humans, like mm, maybe the same damn thing. Um, it would be a, a guess, would be a good guess. And um, uh, so, yeah, definitely you can have liver from, from other animals. That's not a problem. Um, and so, yeah, chicken liver is perfectly fine. 
Dallas Parr, thank you for the super chat. Uh, does the Randall cycle store both energy coming uh, from carbs and or fat if there is too much? If so, why do you say that excess fat is removed by a number two if there is too much fat? So it's not about uh, too much fat in your system. It's about more fat than your body can absorb. Your body's only going to absorb a certain amount of fat. So if you eat an excess amount of fat, your body's just not going to absorb it. But the fat that's in your body, in your system, is going to get utilized. Of course it is. Uh, and if you're eating that with carbohydrates, yes, you're still going to absorb the same amount of fat. And now you're bringing in carbohydrates, which will trigger the Randall cycle, which will shut off your cells to more energy. And that's going to get stored in the fat. Absolutely. But that's not the fat's fault. That's the carbohydrates fault. That's the insulin's fault. That's the deranging your metabolism and your physiology's fault. So it's not the fat. So the fat isn't the problem. It's the carbs that are the problem as usual. Uh, Preston Meyer, thank you for the super chat. Uh, hey, Doc, I'm doing carnivore to get off meds for bipolar. Um, should I abstain from plain Greek yogurt, sour cream, cheeses, pretty much all dairy? I mean, I would, at least for now. And um, you know, anything with carbs, obviously, you just want to stay away from. Um, you know, a bit of Greek yogurt or something like that, you know, as a condiment, uh, sometimes, you know, maybe, but see how they affect you. I mean, if you're if you're getting rid of of all the carbs, you know, that's, that's the major one. And you're going to improve your biochemistry. You're going to improve your mitochondria and hopefully improve your bipolar, um, should do most people do. And so, um, maybe just go clean, just, just meat and water of, of whatever meats you want, fatty meats, a lot of fat and, uh, you know, butter probably fine. Most people do fine with butter and, um, do that for a few months. See how you feel then add in a bit of Greek yogurt. I would never use any of these things as more than a condiment. You know, you can compulsively eat these things. They have casomorphines that will um, act on your opiate receptors and, and they just, they're just a bit addictive. They're not much. You're not going to get like high off them, but um, you will, uh, you, you can stimulate your body to, to eat more than, than your body wants. So, you know, just do that. And uh, on just a straight up meat and water diet at first, and see how you go, and, um, and then uh, uh, and then you can add some of those things back as a condiment. You know, just a bit of cheese melted onto meat, a bit of sour cream mixed in with some ground beef, and uh, you know, same with the yogurt, that sort of thing. And uh, see how you go. And if it if it is adds something to the flavor, and you enjoy it, and you're not worried about it, and it makes you feel good, great. And if it makes you feel not as good, then, you know, that's a good piece of information to have, but you, you won't know unless you try it without. Todd Booth, thank you for the super chat. 10 months carnivore, and I just started adding in vegetables. I can't believe how awful they taste. I used to love them. Uh, yeah, I, 100%. I mean, that's the thing. We, we get so used to them. It's just Stockholm syndrome. We're like, oh, yeah, I like these. No, you don't like them. You just like them. You you dislike them less than the other vegetables, and so you, you can stand some of them, and then you get them again, you're like, oh my God, what is that? But just remember when you were a kid, you know, most people hated the taste of vegetables when they were a kid. I loathed broccoli when I was a kid. I could not stand it. Um, and then as an adult, it was like, yeah, I mean, I guess I can have it. It was never interesting to me. It was never like, yeah, I was like, you're supposed to eat vegetables. I guess I can do broccoli. I guess I can eat some of this garbage. And um, hated it as a kid, just absolutely hated it. And, uh, you know, then we get, you get away from this stuff and you taste it again. You're like, yeah, there it is. You know, there's that nasty taste again. And there's that, that bad taste is, is your brain warning you that there are chemicals in there that are harmful. You know, definitely good idea to listen to that. So yeah, sometimes it's good to, to, um, see that contrast and see what it does to you again, just to make sure that you're actually, actually on the right track. Um, so, uh, Louis Roy or Louis Roy, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, hello, two months on a carnivore, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. My biggest challenge is constant constipation. I need to stay to defeat autoimmunity. Any suggestions, please? Two suggestions. One, with autoimmunity, it's really best if you just stay on red meat and water. So just uh, beef, lamb, goat, venison, really beef and lamb is what most people are going to have access to. Cut out all dairy, even eggs and, and bacon, pork, uh, things like that. Butter is usually fine. Uh, but stick to the ruminant animals, the, the red meat sort of animals. Um, constipation means you're not eating enough fat. 
by definition. Now, that's for actual constipation, for actual hard, dry, constipated stools. Some people think that just because you're going in frequently, that's constipation. That's not constipation. Constipation is dry, hard, constipated stools. Um, and that means you need to eat more fat by definition. If you are getting that kind of constipation, you have to eat more fat. Um, and because your body has limited capacity to, to absorb fat, then it's a spillover mechanism. And that excess fat gets into the stools and uh, keeps it soft. So uh, if it's just infrequent, uh, don't worry about it because you're just you're just uh, going less because you have less waste because you're you're eating less uh, fiber and garbage like that that your body didn't want in the first place. So uh, yeah, that's what I would do, and I would I really just stick to um, red meat and water. Um, Leon Flores, thank you for the super chat. I'm not seeing a a question attached, um, but maybe there's one down the road. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan Nowers, thank you for the super chat. Uh, good morning from Rivervale. Uh, thoughts on strict carnivore beef jerky, uh, salt and beef. Uh, it's allowed me to maintain a healthy size, whereas before I couldn't eat as much fresh meat. Any thoughts nutrient wise? Uh, no, it's fine. I mean, as long as it's clean, it doesn't have, have a bunch of, of uh, you know, whatever soy and sugar and garbage like that. Um, and also, you know, beef jerky is generally pretty lean. So just be, just be mindful of that. Uh, but you know, and dried beef, you know, it's like, it's like a big chunk of meat shrunk down because it takes all the water out. So it's actually quite nutrient dense. And uh, no, I don't think you're losing anything from a nutrient standpoint, um, apart from not getting as much fat. And if it has soy and sugar and all that sort of garbage, then that's less good as well. So that, that most, that's bad. <laughs> I would, I would not eat that. Uh, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, that that's fine. If you want to eat beef jerky, make sure you're getting enough fat too, though. Um, uh, Mitch, thank you for the super chat. I have a friend who tried carnivore and his gout flared up. Does gout get better if he sticks with it? Yeah, generally. So um, some people find that they might have a, 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 a flare up or two of gout uh, after they go carnivore and it tends to, to go away after that. So just stick with it. Um, Remember that there's five different causes of gout. Not all of them are uric acid crystals, right? Only one of them is, and so it could be it could be something else. You know, people get uh, oxalates are actually a cause of gout, uh, or it's now called pseudo gout, um, but it used to be called gout. It used to be five causes of gout. Now it's one cause of gout, uric acid, and then there's other ones are pseudo gout. It's all gout, and um, oxalates are one of them. And so if you get oxalate dumping and things like that, you know, potentially you can get like a flare up like that. Um, and, you know, I, I was talking to someone too, there was like, oh, they were getting their gout and they were getting kidney stones. All that. I was like, that's not gout, like that's oxalates. You know, they're getting kidney stones, like, like calcium oxalate stones and they're getting calcium oxalates in their joints, you know, and uh, and, that, and that goes away. If you're, you're sort of persistently having problems, you can look into Sally Norton's work and see about um, going on a protocol very low amounts of oxalates, you know, like 50 milligrams a day, and that can slow down the dumping if there's like sort of big problems with that. But uh, no, in general, people uh, have a maybe a, a, a flare up or two, and then it goes away and stays away. And they may not even get a flare up, but you know, if you do, it's usually limited. Chase, thank you for the super chat. Can being on beef only diet cause hair loss? Also, are there any micronutrients missing that are worth mentioning? Uh, no, there's no micronutrients missing from meat. You get everything you need in the proportion that you need it um, if you're eating good quality meat. Now, the meat that we're eating is not necessarily pasture raised or it's not wild game or anything like that where it's not eating what it's supposed to eat, so it's not going to necessarily have the same micronutrient profile that it would have if it, if it were. And so keep that in mind. If that's the case and you, you want to add in a bit more nutrients, you add in a bit of liver, kidney, and heart. It uh, doesn't need to be much. They're very nutrient dense, uh, but you add some of those in and that 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 will sort you out. Um, as far as hair loss is concerned, no, beef only diet won't cause hair loss. Um, but unless you're not eating enough, you're not eating enough protein, if you're basically starving yourself. Uh, but, you know, fasting studies where people have gotten hair loss, um, eating a, at least 100 grams of protein and really nothing else. That has stopped those side effects like hair loss. So if you're eating enough, eating enough meat, eating enough fat, um, no, you're not. You're not going to get it from eating meat. Now maybe you have a thyroid issue, maybe you have some other sort of issue that can cause hair loss. 
check that out, make sure that that's not the problem. If the, those aren't the case, then then no. Um, but what it can do, uh, any sort of ketogenic diet, like a carnivore diet, uh, can trigger a fallout phase of your hair. So you can get some hair falling out early on, but then it grows back and it tends to grow back thicker. Women, uh, this becomes much more uh, noticeable because they have longer hair. So it's much more noticeable when that's coming out. And then it takes a lot longer to fill back in because it's uh, now to grow. <laughs> it takes years to grow back. And so, you know, you're just seeing, but, but look for little buds of hair and smaller hair. That That's what people normally do see is that they'll have some hair fall out. Now, maybe you're low on folate or B12 or something like that. So check that. And if you are, have some liver, add in liver a couple times a week, two, three times a week, chicken livers are fine. And so, you know, do that, make sure that you're getting enough of these nutrients. And if you are, then don't worry about it. It'll grow back and it tends to grow back thicker uh, from for most everybody. Carly A, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Doc. How do you feel about using castor oil to moisturize and using essential oils? I'm 65 years old, mostly carnivore female. I drink mushroom coffee. Um, well, I probably have more of a problem with the mushroom coffee than the than the the castor oil, but I would I would probably avoid the castor oil and essential oils as well. Basically, don't put anything on your skin that you wouldn't eat because most of that's going to soak in and be in your bloodstream in 20 minutes anyway. So those essential oils, they can get into your body. They can actually become hormonal um, disruptors, endocrine disruptors, and screw with your hormones. And so you really don't want those. You don't want those scented candles and air fresheners. That can actually mess with your hormones. It's absolutely, absolutely crazy. Um, and so putting that on your skin can certainly do that. A lot of these scents and, and fragrances and things like that that we use can absolutely disrupt and screw up our, our hormonal health. So I would, I would actually avoid that. The best... Uh, things to put on your skin are animal fats. So tallow, emu oil, things like that, ostrich oil. You can get these things um, very readily. You can just make it yourself. You can, you know, use, uh, you know, tallow or lard or whatever that you just buy. You know, my, I have a, a partnership with, um, with uh, um, Stone and Spear Tallow and they make tons of, of tallow products with, with no, you can get them with scents. You get them without scents. I get them with, without scents. And, uh, and tallow soap as well. I, I mean, that's what I, I, I really much prefer. It It doesn't dry out your skin as much, you know, it doesn't get it all just horrible, dry and, and nasty. Um, it's much nicer on your skin. Um, and, uh, I prefer it. And so, you know, you can get those sorts of things, but just, just animal fats in general are going to be much better. You want to get them without the essential oils and the, and the scents and things like that. <laughs> Stephen uh, Hadhazi, thank you for the super chat. When you consume excess fat and your body expels the surplus, does it also expel other essential nutrients like protein or even medications you may have ingested alongside your meal? No, you shouldn't. It shouldn't, um, you know, take, you know, the good with the with the excess. Um, it's just a matter of you just eating this, and you're and there's all this stuff in your small intestine, the bile will emulsify the broken down fat and it will absorb that. When you run out of bile, then you just have free floating fat um, that um, you know isn't going to isn't going to be able to be absorbed. But it's not it's not going to draw out and pull out uh, other things and stop you from absorbing them like fiber does. Fiber does that. So fiber can um, you know prevent the absorption of up to 30% of the food that you eat, right? So you know that's obviously another another strike against fiber. Uh, but no, fat fat won't do that. Um, let me see here. So, sorry, just just gonna read this here. Okay, so. Um, so uh, Harry W, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, have a have a mate's body seems to go through cycles of not wanting meat. Uh, can't stand the smell or keep it down uh, for a month or so. Uh, has to revert to a veg diet um, until her body says, "Give me meat." 
what could be uh, going on or the remedy it could be that her body's just telling her to fast. Um, you know, sometimes when your body's telling you don't eat meat, it's not telling you not to eat meat. It's telling you not to eat because your body is designed to eat meat, it's supposed to eat meat. Um, and so if it's telling you not to eat meat, it's basically telling you not to eat. So you don't have to eat just for the sake of eating unless you're like very emaciated. There might be something else medical going on, but that's very, very uncommon. Um, so uh, what I would do is if the body's telling her like, you know, don't eat meat, just don't eat, you know, you know, fast for a day or two, you know, or whatever it takes. And then, you know, meat's going to taste good again. It's going to smell good again. Um, sometimes in pregnancy that happens as well. People have meat aversions. And, um, you know, I've sort of a bit of that opinion that it's probably just your body telling you to fast and just not eat anything. I've spoken to a number of other doctors and OBGYNs who use carnivore diet for their, their pregnant patients and, and to help people um, become fertile and get pregnant in the first place. And they say the same thing, you know, like Dr. Kiltz has said the same thing. That's just your body telling you to fast and you just, you need to stop eating anything. It generally lasts a couple of days and then it goes back. So, um, that's, that's what I would try is just, you know, try not eating anything. Just try fasting, uh, for a day or two until her body wants it. You know, I've done that where I, when I was, my body was losing weight where I had excess fat to lose and I started eating meat and I was like, Oh my God, no, I don't want this. I'm like, why wouldn't I want this? I love steak. Uh, because my body didn't want it. I didn't need the, I didn't need the nutrients. I was good. And so that's probably, that's usually what happens. And so um, that sounds like a pretty extreme case, but I would bet it's the same um, result is that if, if she just stops eating altogether, the next day it'll probably taste fine, or maybe it takes another day or something like that. Eventually it's going to taste fantastic. And, um, but I wouldn't eat poison until it does. So a comment from DS111, um, doctor, months ago you asked, or I asked if carnivore would benefit my 86-year-old uh, dad with his unmedicated cirrhosis condition. You said, yes, that meat is nutrient dense. Um, and it goes on to say, and it has helped his liver function increase. That's fantastic. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, you know, cirrhosis is one of those things where it's a permanent scarring. You can't undo that scarring, but there's still parts of the liver that function, hopefully, because you're not in complete liver failure and need a liver transplant. So um, those parts that are still working, hopefully can can get back to normal working order and and uh, and recover and then, you know, take up the slack for the part that has has been uh, has died off. So really glad to hear that. Uh, it's a great job, and hopefully he's found a lot of other benefits from from that as well. Good stuff. Thank you for sharing. And any other any other sort of uh, success stories that people have, please you know share down below in the comments because it's always great for people to see this when they're thinking about like, ooh, what do I do? And uh, and they see like, oh, that's the problem I have, and that's helped thirty people here. So yeah, I'm that's that's something that's very helpful for people. Nick Jennings, thank you for the super chat. Keep spreading the news of this life-saving tool. I'm one year in and down 206 pounds. Holy good. Wow. That's great. Um, was 430 pounds, now 224 pounds. Diabetes is gone. And psoriatic arthritis is non-existent uh, among many other changes. Thank you. That's fantastic, Nick. That's really great to hear. Amazing job. I mean, you've lost, you've lost a whole people. You've lost an entire Nick Jennings. And that is, that's amazing. So, you know, that, that, that's gotta be amazing feeling getting off of all those meds and getting away from those, these diseases and getting all that excess weight off. Um, really, really well done. I hope you just really enjoy, uh, you know, just being happy, healthy and, um, and, and able to be more active. And uh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I hope that um, other people are inspired by that. I'm sure they will be. Bree Miss Ireland, thank you very much for the super chat. It's difficult sticking to carnivore. I'm a sweet lover. How can I cut sugar cravings, especially late at night when I want a bowl of cereal? Thanks. Need to eat more. So eat more fatty meat um, and a lot more fat as well. You know, that's how you get rid of those cravings. Uh, sometimes cravings can just be something as simple as your, your brain wants more energy. And so it's telling you to get energy. And, and one of the only ways it knows is, is to get carbs. Um, also, that addiction is an addiction. And so eventually you can break that addiction, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it takes some time, usually about two weeks. And so you just eat a lot of fatty meat until you have less and less cravings. If you ever have a craving, 
yeah, it's telling your body's telling you to eat something, eat, but eat meat, eat fat, um, animal fat, and uh, and that should help with the cravings. And uh, you know, drink plenty of water and eat plenty of fatty meat. And uh, after about two weeks, they should be gone. But even just doing that will do, will suppress them significantly, and uh, and you won't have as bad of cravings. And yeah, you get cravings late at night, eat meat, and uh, that should hopefully uh, take care of it at least to get get to bed and not have to not have to eat some cereal in the middle of the night like Kellogg's seemingly wants us to do. The CEO of Kellogg's saying, "Oh yeah, you know we we." We care about people and their plight. So, you know, and, and this hard economic time. So, you know, you, you can just eat cereal for dinner. Like, oh, yeah, it's great. Like, you know, get the hell out of here. Yeah, you like, you give a shit about people and their plight. You just want to sell more goddamn cereal. And um, and it's this stuff is poison. And you know it's poison. And you know it's making them sick. And, uh, and you don't care because uh, you just you profit from all of that. You can just tell he's just had this little you know, snarky, cocky grin on his face. Oh yeah, we'll just eat cereal. You know, he's, he's just had a face you want to punch, you know? And it's like, um, you know, so yeah, don't listen to that garbage, garbage monsters and uh, just eat meat, be happy, be healthy. And then you get out of the clutches of these, these, you know, demon bond villains. Low carb, low drama. Thank you very much for the very generous super chat. That's very kind of you. Hi, Dr. Chafee. Um, is there more L-tryptophan in grass-fed meat than grain-fed meat to help with sleep? I appreciate your passion and generosity in uh, sharing your nutritional info uh, to help improve people's health. All power to you. Um, that's a, that's a very good question. I believe I believe that is the case, but I'm actually not sure. Unfortunately, I wish I had a clear answer for you, um, but. Um, um, I'm not too sure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100 sure, but I, I do think so because tryptophan is a bit, is a bit uncommon in general. And so, you know, the, it would, it would, um, make sense that it's going to be in more high quality meats, but unfortunately I actually don't know. And I feel really bad because it's such a big super chat. I don't actually have, uh, the answer for you, but I'll, I'll see if I can look it up and uh, report back, but um, it might be possible to look up and look up tryptophan levels in, um, you know, USDA beef. They should have tryptophan levels on USDA should have that on their average things. And then you look up grass finished, grass fed finished, regeneratively raised. Sometimes there's not, there aren't, there aren't many resources on that. Sometimes it's individual ranchers have published their own data for their, their meat. Um, and it's not necessarily like a whole big database that, they, that it would be up on. So that might be the best way to look. I'll see if I can find it. If I do, I'll, I'll try and uh, chime it in sometime and hopefully, hopefully you see it. Um, and, you know, but that, that that's a place that you could uh, Google around and try to find as well. Jennifer Ray, thank you very much for the super chat. I started uh, beef butter, bacon and eggs two weeks ago, and my lips are extremely dry. I'm drinking enough water, but I feel dehydrated. <laughs> If you feel dehydrated, then you're probably not um, hydrated. Uh, so, you know, thing is, is that we can we can drink a lot of water and, and still not have uh, adequate amounts. You know, again, when you're when you're changing your diet like this, you're changing to a ketogenic diet. You, get, you might be losing a bit more electrolytes early on. They'll bring water, water with it. You might need a bit more water if you're taking a whole bunch of electrolytes. You'll are, you'll need more water. Actually, you are you increase your body's demand for more water. And so uh, if you feel dehydrated, drink more water, eat more fat. Fat is very good for your skin health. Sometimes we'll have dry skin. It's not it's healthy. They're not eating enough fat. And that, that can be very helpful to uh, their skin, their lips. But if you're getting chapped lips, you're probably dehydrated and should drink more water. So just try that. Um, it may be that your body actually needs a lot more water than you think it does. Most people drink too little water. They just do. And, and I talked to people, oh, I, I definitely, I drink a lot of water. Okay, how much are you drinking? Oh, like a liter, liter and a half a day. And I'm like, that's not enough water. So, you know, it's, um, especially when you're having symptoms like that, you know, that that are quite commonly associated with, with um, dehydration. You feel dehydrated, your lips are dry. You know, just just um, address that. And if that's not that's not the, the culprit, then you can try eating more fat as well. Do both. Increase the fat, increase the water, should sort it out. 
plant sparing carnivore. Nice. Uh, hi, Dr. Chay. Thank you for the, for the super chat. Sorry. Um, hi, Dr. Chafee. In my opinion, blue zone thing is not even a study. Thank you so much for all you do. I 100% agree. That's not a study. It's propaganda. It's a marketing term. It's a flat out lie. They went around to Sardinia and all these places during Lent when they weren't eating much meat and they, or they just lied. They flat out lied. You know, they said that Sardinia is all oh, they, oh, they don't eat meat. Only eat meat like once a week. It's all plant-based. Otherwise, bullshit. That is a flat out lie. You know, uh, Professor Bill Schindler went to Sardinia and went to the same area that Dan Butner went to. And they were even saying, why does everyone think we're plant-based? Like, what the hell is that about? You know, he was even saying, like, why is that? That's really weird. That's funny because that's not, that's the, you know, that wasn't what we told Dan. So he's a liar. He's just a liar and uh, an ideologue. He's a Seventh-day Adventist church member. He's one of the high ups. He's trying to push this dogma on people and profit off of it. He made $70 million dollars off the blue zone studies by selling it to the seventh day Adventist church. And they probably funded the whole thing. Anyway, he is a con artist and, um, and a flat out lie. So no, that's not a study. That's a propaganda piece. It's a flat out lie. And he's an asshole. And, uh, please tell him I said that. Uh, Kareem and, uh, Millis, uh, thank you very much for the super chat. I'm not seeing any question attached or down below, um, so sorry for that. If there is something, maybe pop it up, but, um, I'm not seeing one anyway. Um, Bushy Doki, thank you for the super chat. Thanks for busting your, <laughs> busting your ass on studying the carnivore subject and going through med school. You are one resilient person. I'd hate to play a sport against you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Look, it's just something that interests me and medicine's always interested in me and, and just being healthy has always interested me. And just helping people has always interested me. You, know, you sort of, um, you sort of feel that if you, I've always felt that if you have the ability to help someone, you have a responsibility to help them, and um, you have to do what you can uh, to to reach out and help people in your community. We have a global community. Uh, we're able to connect on on uh, social media and through the internet, as we're able to reach everybody around the world and and help them. And so I, I think that you have to. And so it's uh, important to me to to be able to do this and to bring this to people and i'm just very thankful that it has helped people and that that people are taking this and sharing it with other people and helping other people because again it's all about your spheres of influence you know it's about you doing this having good results other people seeing that getting interested and you encouraging them to try it um you guys are all the ones doing this it's not it's not me you know i, I have a, a platform that people can go to and look at for advice and for help, but you're the one who has to do it, you know, and it's you doing it that then sets the example and the, and, and the benchmark for people around you to say, you know, I want that, you know, that's something that can work. Okay. You know, Dr. Chafee, yeah, well, he plays sports, he works out, he does, he probably does steroids, all these sorts of things. So maybe can't trust that, but okay, Dave, you know, Dave lost, you know, all this weight, you know, we had, um, you know, our friend before lost, you know, 206 pounds. I mean, good Lord, you know, I mean, in, in a year. So, you know, and his healthy reversing diabetes, all these sorts of things, you know, that's, um, that's great, you know, and people see that and they notice that and they take, and they pay attention to that. So like, okay, well, if, that, if, a, if a normal person can do this, then why can't I, you know, and, uh, and you can, everyone can, and, um, and you will, you just eat real food. Real food for humans, you know, real food to a koala is not just whole food. It's eucalyptus or meat. Any animal can eat meat, you know, because you're trying to turn whatever you're eating into yourself and you're made out of meat. And so any animal can eat meat. Herbivores uh, do opportunistically eat smaller animals all the time. And, uh, and that's because that's the most nutrient dense food out there is other animals. And um, some animals can turn plant tissue into animal tissue, but it's very difficult. 70% of animal species are carnivores for exactly that reason. They can't turn animal, plant tissue into animal tissue. They need to eat other animals to in order to get the nutrients that they need. So all animals can eat meat, but only some animals can eat plants. And when they eat those plants, it's specific plants. So the plants that a koala eats are different from the plants that, that nearly every other animal on earth eats. I don't know of another animal that eats eucalyptus, you know, maybe some bugs. But uh, it's pretty much pretty much the koala, you know. That's it, and uh, and that's the thing. So that's food to koala. 
This is food to us. You eat real food for your species, which is human, and uh, that's meat, then you're going to get healthy. You're going to get healthier, a lot healthier than you were before. And, um, and then, you know, and we get back to, you know, as doctors to treating the things that are actually uh, something that we can help with accidents, emergencies, injuries, um, child, you know, pregnancy and childbirth, congenital and genetic defects, um, infectious disease, poisonings, you know, snake bites, malnutrition, those sorts of things. That's real medicine. You know, that's real healthcare. You know, dealing with diabetes and autoimmunity and heart disease and cancer, you know, that that's just that's treating the effects of um, bad advice and uh, and and an inappropriate diet and and toxic exposures that have built up to the breaking point. And so the the treatment for that is to remove the exposures, just like you have lead poisoning, you get rid of the lead, right? You get rid of the exposures. That's that's number one. What you do, you have some medicines to help you get through it. Great. But the first thing you do is you get rid of the exposures. And so that's what we're doing here. You're getting rid of all the, uh, as many exposures as you can. So you can be as health, healthy as you possibly can be. And that's what we're trying to do. So thank you all for helping me with that. I really appreciate that. Um, that's, uh, we sort of come to the end of the super chat sort of right on time, uh, just at the, the 12 o'clock mark. We're nearly three hours now. Thank you all uh, to everyone who stuck with me um, throughout all of this. I know it's a long, long sort of thing. Uh, it goes quicker than you think, though. Uh, three hours just sort of went pretty quick for me anyway. You guys may have been bored as hell. But um, thank you very much uh, for all of that. Uh, and please do, yeah, well, thanks for everyone watching. And please do hit the like if you're not subscribed. Maybe think about that. Check out my other videos. Um, on getting started on a carnivore diet. There's a whole playlist there. There's a playlist on cancer. There's a playlist on athletics and building muscle and all these other sorts of things that people are interested in. Uh, they can find those there and uh, try to be curated. So it's not it's not uh, just, I mean, there's just too many videos. I've, all, I've actually often thought about maybe not doing more videos along. It's cat's out of the bag now, but, you know, it's um, just because I didn't want to water down the message. You know, as I had these, these specific videos I thought were really good and really important. I was like, that's what I want people to know about. Um, and you know, if I keep doing these things, it's just going to sort of, um, you know, then it can, uh, just water down and, and, and maybe make it so people don't see those. So go to those, those, um, go to those playlists, the getting started on a carnivore diet. Those ones, I think those are some of the most important videos that, that I've done and, or they're not even all my videos there are other, other people's videos too. Um, and then things on cancer and things on, um, you know, athletics and building muscle and those sorts of things. So, you know, check out those playlists as well. Please do share this with people. And um, thank you all for joining. Um, for people that are still interested in going to uh, the Regenerate Conference, that'll be April 20th, 21st in Melbourne. So, you know, check out the Regenerate uh, website and see if you can um, still get tickets. It'd be great to see you guys there. Thank you all, everyone. I really appreciate it. We'll see you back here in three days for the premiere and the next release of my next new video and then the lives next week as well. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Great to see you all.